Dean? Yes. Good. Thank you. Do you hear us? Okay, well, that was. Uh, Mark. 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 We're having. Yeah, yes, please. Uh, that was a uh, very good meeting. Actually, reach a conclusion on some things. Yes, we did. Oh, Not to everybody's liking, probably. Oh, yes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we had uh, we had sent around a list of some of the questions that we had after we saw uh, the spreadsheets uh, for uh, the uh, school budget, and uh, I think everybody got a copy of those, right? Yes. Um, and uh, the. Uh, purpose of this sort of is that um, as we've had conversations in the past between the committees um, one of the questions that was always asked is uh, why the finance committee doesn't spend a lot of time right from the very beginning of the year going through the school budget with the school committee and uh, the answer is has really always been that um, because there's been this state mandated minimum and because Granby had always operated uh, with the school budget of the state mandated minimum plus the additional overrides uh, that we voted for the schools $305,000 plus the additional uh, which is now $400,000 retired teacher health care which by accident is not as part is not part of the town contributions for Granby though it is for the rest of the state or almost all the rest of the state that as long as the budget was within those sort of parameters and the school committee has complete freedom to swap money around even between uh, expenses and compensation that uh, there wasn't much point you know there was really nothing that the that the finance committee uh, would be able to uh, say well look, would you cut this have you thought about cutting this out of the budget or cutting out of the budget? because it didn't make any difference you had to spend that minimum amount of money uh, but as soon as as soon as amounts above that are asked for then uh, the finance committee would really like to know what the money is going to be used for. So we have a way to think about it and to think about whether or not it's appropriate to ask the town for more, more money. Um, and again, once, as we said uh, at the beginning of this meeting, that as long as money is coming from an override fund, if people are willing to spend override money to uh, support higher budgets in the schools, um, then the town has spoken, they said they thought about it, and we want to commit the money on the long-term basis for the schools. Uh, then that also is fine with us, uh, as long as the uh, people understand what it is they're voting for. But when you come back to the point of asking for stabilization fund money, then we have some concerns. And so what we'd like to do is find out more about what's in the budget, uh, both on the income side and on the expenditure side, uh, so we can able to think then about these extra amounts of money. Okay. Anything, anybody else want to comment from our point of view? Okay. So um, we can go through these in order. We can go through them in whatever kind of way you just, like. Just, or just to make sure. If you want to say something else. Yeah, anyone from the uh, committee, yeah. uh, feel free to jump in. I'm not sure that we're asking to, to get together to go through the school budget each time line by line. In fact, you know, I'm not even yeah. sure that that's, that's the main purpose, but I think there's a benefit in all of us understanding the different angles. Uh, you know, your committee understands the municipal finance side of things. Uh, we have a lot more exposure uh, with the school finance side of things. So it's good to be, uh, to, to keep each other uh, abreast of things that are changing, whether it's in the budget. It wasn't really, the intent wasn't really to go line by line with everything uh, and, and uh, cutting things or changing things or moving things. When those things happen at large scale, there can be communication and the communication can be part of those meetings, uh, obviously. But it wasn't necessarily why we were asking to get together. It was just to make sure that we're all keeping each other abreast with uh, what's going on on both sides of the, of the uh, town. With the school budget being such a large portion of the town's expenditures, uh, I was glad to hear the idea come up that uh, on a more regular basis that the three committees ought to be able to get together and have some discussion about what the financial situation is with the schools. So yes. uh, that was good to hear. Okay. So can what? I, can I, I'm terribly sorry, but I don't know everybody on your board. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm Marie McCourt. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Bob Glessman. I'm John Libera. 
I'm Jim Hartley. I'm Rob Cannon. Scott Wilson. Thank you. Should we do the same thing for the sure. with the school committee? Deanne Payne Workowski. I said Marie. Marie. Oh. Marie. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Ben. Yeah. No. He, so I'm Mike Simpson. Um, Mike, actually, this is Mike's very first meeting as a newly elected member of our committee. He was just elected to our committee uh, yesterday. Welcome so welcome aboard. aboard. And there's one other committee member who's... Uh, yeah, who could not be here because of a family emergency. Yeah. yeah. Jen, Jen, Jennifer Curran. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Marie. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we want to we want to talk about the questions as they're presented on here, or go through a different I ask order. A or question anything? first. Obviously, you've changed your budget from what was presented to us. Can you quickly tell us what occurred? Well, just so it might it might influence some of the questions. Sure. We're, you we're know, asking. the budget as presented first in February changed yeah. when we uh, presented a public hearing in April. There are several influences in the budget. Um, the budget is that a budget an estimate. Um, as we move through the process, uh, we recognize um, that we may have some staffing changes. Uh, we may have influence of, of students uh, moving in or leaving the district. Uh, we also are uh, moving through the process of um, receiving bids uh, for open contracts such as transportation. Certainly that was on the table this year. Our oil bill uh, bid was on the table this year. So as we move from February to where we are now, there are certain changes that happen. With that being said, as a new administration, uh, we are looking across the district at ways to be uh, more efficient. Um, and so uh, I think the special education department is a good example. Um, the fact that we were able to, um, within our budget this year, accommodate some of the unanticipated uh, expenses and increases um, in tuitions for our students uh, was the result of uh, caseload analysis that is a standard process for a spe uh, special ed director to uh, do. Um, and as a result of that, we were able to uh, manage some of those uh, unanticipated costs. So those are things that happen um, all throughout the budget process uh, that will influence that sort of changing number until um, we get to uh, where we put a number forward on town meeting floor. But there were changes since, uh, I think, April 24th was when you voted the, the previous budget that mm -hmm. had the seven. Right. And so the school committee is, you know, my boss. They direct yeah. me to, you know, reconsider, look again. I bring my team together. We look at um, if there are places that we can see improvement or efficiencies. Uh, we get more information about um, students that may be choosing uh, to leave the district, which leaves some staffing changes that we may be able to uh, to, to do within the budget. Um, but, you know, if the school committee directs me to re-look at the budget, that's what we do. So the, 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 biggest, the biggest pieces since you've seen the two iterations before, uh, two of them were related to the bids because at the time we did not really know the, the transportation and oil. Uh, and two others were related to uh, retirement or uh, one position being vacated. Mm -hmm. So those are the, the largest pieces that basically allowed us to come in, so uh, come down. Went down less than you expected. Mm -hmm. Say it again. They both went down. Transportation and oil. Is that what yes, saying? they both went down. Okay. Yep. Okay. There okay. was some. There was some. Sorry. There was some talk about. Going out to bid with other dis with other towns, which we did. So that happened with the bus here. Yeah, yeah. Yep. We, we also uh, co-bid our lunch uh, through Chartwells with East Hampton, so we share. I mean, there's a lot of discussion about how efficient we could be um, in terms of shared services. That's a good example. We share our food service director with East Hampton um, mm -hmm. through a shared bid, so we get a better better pr price, basically. Mm -hmm. What did the uh, what did the transportation come down to? Do you know offhand? But you, I mean, you don't know oh, offhand. That's all right. You can get, you can get to us. Yeah, I know. Sunday <laughs> night, which was Mother's Day. <laughs> can I remind you? <laughs> Cheryl, do you have the answer to that? We can. You can get it to us later on. Okay, that's fine. Um, uh, the transportation bid, Mark. Who are we bidding with? Uh, we're bidding with Ware and East Hampton. I mean, that's that's a 
a small item, but that's actually a, um, a separate item uh, for the uh, that's listed as to be voted right. in the warrant. And so uh, there'll be one the number that'll be printed up is that one number from April 24th. That there's a different number if Chris knows about it than the actual warrant. The actual it could be uh, uh, the actual uh, warrant can be read as the correct number. Yeah, the up I think the updated budget that uh, we shared with you and uh, Chris includes that uh, reduction in the transportation cost. Right, Mark? Correct. Okay. Um, it, is, it is being rebid because of that. Oh, yeah, there's that too. This, the, yeah, to, what's today, the 16th? Tomorrow, the 17th, will be the opening of the new bid. It was rebid because of uh, one of the bidders dropped off their bid at the wrong location, so they weren't all at the same spot, even though they'd only started opening the bid, so they just went through, they talked to the IG, and they just do a rebid process. So we expect that probably the result will either be the same or maybe somewhat improved, because now everybody knows what the number is, but um, you know, we'll, know, we'll know whether that number improves um, on the 17th. Okay. Um, <clears throat> special Ed. Carol, yes. want to come forward? Carol Hubbard, Director of Public Services for Granby. Nice to meet you. Me too. So, which part do you want to talk about? Uh, the, uh, there's been an increase in transportation from last year to this year of uh, $26,000. Um, and uh, there was also an increase in tuition. And that uh, we had remembered hearing uh, from you before that uh, you were hoping to be able to bring some of the special ed back in house, mm -hmm. uh, and so we just kind of wondered what the what the uh, sense of whether that's still possible, uh, whether this assumes that it's not going to happen or what. So what Carol is going to talk about um, and help, I think, as Emery pointed out, in terms of education. Um, yes, we can save money. However, uh, we save money through cost avoidance. Um, so it isn't that the budget necessarily is reduced, but we're avoiding the cost of sending students out of district when we create programs in district to support our students. So if that was a confusion on my part, I apologize for that. I thought I had explained that at the, at the last meeting. But that's how we anticipate um, keeping costs down in special education. And have the students already committed and to? So we're going to talk about yeah. the number of students that have come back. <coughs> Um, and the number of students that we anticipate um, in our programs uh, and some of the programming uh, moving forward that we'd like to create. Uh, I'm not sure about the terminology. What, what's the difference between cost avoidance and lowering costs? They sound you have the staff, you don't have, somebody needs to go out, you don't have to send them out because you, right. you already got them in house. So let's just say as an example, I have a program that's run right. by one teacher and the teacher salary is $60,000 and it's an in-house program and I put uh, a special education student in that program. Um, that same student may get that service in an out-of-district placement right. where the tuition could range anywhere from 70000 to right. 250000 So instead of sending that student out, we keep the student in. And, right. so and you save $70,000. Yeah, depending on the tuition because right. we have tuitions that go up to... I'm just saying you save money in either. I guess you would made this distinction between avoiding costs and reducing costs. They sound exactly the same to me. I'm just... Unless there's some other difference there. But reduced costs is if, if you have something uh, already in place and if you reduce that position, that's uh, reducing cost. Cost so, avoidance is basically avoiding adding additional costs by using the services that you have in house and therefore somebody doesn't leave the district that would cost us more money. Okay. So, so in those this particular case, if it weren't for the in house program, your, your special ed would have been. Monstrously twice, higher. Exactly. Okay. Twice as much, three times exactly. as much. The other thing to remember is once you create the program, you're not servicing just one student. So, for example, Carol's going to talk about our structured uh, learning center uh, for social emotional learning. We can now service eight students. So now we're cost avoiding tuitions for eight students who potentially could go out of district with just uh, staff within the, within the school department. We answered all questions, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> nice job, guys. <laughs> so 
when I came on board, um, the previous director had already discussed having this program. So um, it was going to be a special education teacher, dual certified, so that she would be have content knowledge as well as special education, and that they were contracting with the with school-based services to provide a case manager and two behavior interventionists and specialized transportation. So to fund the teacher, it was going to come out of the general funds. To fund the contracted services, um, the expectation was three students would return to the district. That hadn't been solidified, mm -hmm. so when I came on board, it was my job to go get the three kids and can, you know, get them parents to agree to come back to the district. So I was successful in getting two out of three. So um, the tuition for one student was 48865 The tuition for the second student, I'll be happy to give you a copy of this, was 49398 The transportation savings was 27000 So we ended up bringing, um, bringing that, the cost of, with the, with the teacher and the two tuitions and the transportation, it was $201,000. With the contract, we needed 231. If we had brought back the, the third student, we would have been over because the third student's tuition was 44718. But I was unable to convince the family that our program would meet their needs because they couldn't see it. I was telling them that we were going to have this program. Now we have this program, and as a result of having this program, as Emory spoke earlier, um, this year, we have another parent who has come. We've done the tour of the program. We've presented the services we have, and that person <coughs> is coming back. So now we have, um, you know, another person that came back. But we started the school year in September with four students in this program. We ended the school year with seven students in this program. So we had, you know, three additional students that had we not had this program could have gone out and if all seven of those students had to be educated in an out of district placement it would have been four hundred and ten thousand six hundred and forty seven dollars with transportation costs at fifty one eight oh two so um, we basically saved by having a program as as cheryl's been saying cost avoidance we saved two hundred and thirty two thousand eight hundred and eighty eight dollars by having this program in house we'll assume that <coughs> cheryl and the school committee tremendously for this and the finance <laughs> no, committee is certainly actually, going to do that what i said was now you can start the ld program <laughs> because that's our next one <laughs> right so what is LD? learning oh, disabilities so that's another um program that you know, that we could do in the district um, and then, you know, prevent students from, from leaving. Um, so this one, this pr program here, I also developed a um, informational flyer, which I sent to all the area communities. Um, I do have one community that is interested in tuition in a student. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as you build, you know, you, you, you have to build it, you have to make it right and then you can advertise it. You know, it's easier to sell a program when people can see it and, you know, be in it, meet the people, and, um, you know, the parent that is coming back um, did that. She came, she toured, she met the staff, she visited the school, and then said, yes, you know, I, let's start transitioning. So that child is already going to start transitioning in June. So he's coming to the school, he's going he's gonna to visit, we're going to, he was in Granby before, we're going to hook him up with some of his friends, they're going to have lunch at the high school, so they're familiar, so, you know, we're trying to make these types of moves um, smoother. So besides being attractive to the students, the, you're saying that the, the tuitioning in cost for the other community so, is basically smaller than they might be able to get through exactly through we else. undercut them you know just <laughs> right. enough to make it appealing right. um, and you know their transportation would only be down the street 
versus no. you know maybe to Springfield or you know to you know further away. Um, and if I may, yeah. what the superintendents are talking about in the region is um, creating these shared programs, shared services, so that you know we may house a social emotional learning program at the high school, but another district may house the social emotional learning uh, program for the elementary school where we may only have one student and so it's not efficient for us to do that although we want a public school experience for our children um, because being in a public school and being able to integrate into classrooms is important um, as opposed to some of our out-of-district placements which are private school um, not really don't um, mirror what we do in the public schools in terms of integrated services and having kids in uh, with their peers. Um, and so that is a secondary goal of ours. Not only is it for um, being fiscally responsible, but it's um, uh, socially and emotionally developmentally appropriate uh, for our children. Right. And they are, they're exposed to rigorous curriculum, whereas when they are in a special school, if you're, you know, it's focusing on that. And the teachers m most of the time are special education solely they're you know they don't have a content so when they're doing math they're doing math you know it's not geog you know geometry calculus you know things like that it's they just do general kind of math so in projections for next year um, right at this point um, I'm projected to have eight students um, in the, in the program for September um, with one of those students, one of the ones returning. So again, a cost avoidance of $280,902. But now that I know that I can come to the town, and well, I'm just kidding. Right, yeah, <laughs> well that's, that's the other, um, so I presented, you know, I yeah, as soon as I heard that, I was like, I'm like, what? <laughs> because I, we have unexpected things. So there, there have been 10 students in the, uh, over the course of the school year that have either moved into the district or have needed some, um, a change in placement. They may have needed um, increased staff um, in order to be successful. So um, I have the budget impact. Um, and then the you know the transportation as you were speaking why you know the increase in transportation yours says 26 I have us at um, 35,631 which was in, unanticipated um, many of the um, students was a change in their placement or or someone moved into the district and we didn't have to um, the way the 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 rules work is it's called a move-in law if they move in after um, April 1st the other district has to pay the tuition but we are still responsible for transportation so I have one student who moved in and we don't have to pay the tuition for his program but we do have to pay the transportation they moved into Granby they moved into Granby yeah. um, we will have to pick up come July 1st that tuition um, you know at an out-of-district placement um, we also had one student um, as a result of uh, the chapter 222 um, regulations of um, a uh, felony that we needed to put in a in a program yeah. so that resulted in an out-of-district placement as well as transportation so I have that as well, and then as Cheryl alluded to earlier, we had a family um, move in um, where we needed to provide sheltered English um, immersion um, instruction because they did not speak English. So some of the transportation costs are for uh, students who actually live in Granby and some of them to move to a school that's out of the district. Yep. Okay. Yep. And, and the extra tuition is uh, all for um, students who have who live in Granby? Yeah. Who are more than what we've had in past years, or yeah. or different schools? Or, or a different need. You know, we don't have the you know like we have one that that needed an extended evaluation. We were trying to determine whether or not we could meet the child's needs, and so we did an extended eval. Um, but in the end, he needed a, a more a more restrictive setting. Okay. 
So I have that for you as well. Any other questions? Thank you very much. You are welcome. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, utilities, electricity and heating, perhaps that's what you referred to as you, had, you have more up-to-date estimates. <laughs> well, just, you know, the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> I warmed it up. <laughs> and it's appropriate since we're talking about uh, heating oil. <laughs> <laughs> well, for the heating oil, um, we have the additional amount factored into the budget. I mean, last year, the school was fortunate to be able to lock in at a very low rate. Um, and this year, although we got a good rate, you know, oil has gone up. So the difference that you see, the increase, which was like 27, 28%, was a combination of that factor, the fact that you know the oil price increased 20%. Plus, we also increased the gallons by 2,800 gallons because we were running a little thin this year. So we went back to FY16's estimate of our oil usage because it's a lot cheaper to um, basically have oil and fill your tanks at the end of the summer than it is if you run out and you have to buy at the market rate. Um, as for the electricity, that's kind of, you know, that's a kind of where we're taking a little bit of a wait and see approach because we originally budgeted it 10% um, higher in the overall LEA. It's 15% in the, I mean, in the overall funds budget. It's 10% higher in the local. Um, actually, switch that around. But the reason why we um, have that budget at 10% is the district was on a, it was a real time contract where you would get hourly rates for your kilowatt hours. And it works out really well when it's low, but if you end up having any disruption in your service, then the kilowatt hours can go up substantially. That didn't happen over the course of the year, but the COG, which offers it, discontinued that program. So now we're on a fixed rate. So we've gone from what we, the district experienced as 6.6 .6 kilowatt hours through the course of this past year into a locked-in rate of 9.8 cents per kilowatt hour, which is obviously higher, but it's still... Um, you know, substantially less than what it is if you would look at it today. But the other factor to it that we have kicking in that will ameliorate some of that increase is that we're just starting to realize the net metering credits from the contract that we did with the solar farm. So we'll be getting basically um, kind of a 20% reduction off of our bill, which for the first month we just got literally a couple of days ago, which was like $1,300. So that hopefully we'll see that continue through the course of the of this year but um, it's basically a credit based on the production from the farm and the percentage that the contract buys the school. There's no credit built into this budget, is what you're saying? Correct. So that there could be 1,200 hours a month, something like that, okay. Well, why did you just finally get credit? Well, I guess the contract... Well, I'll do it this way. Are you dealing with NRG? <laughs> no, it's not NRG. It's not NRG no, because, not, because I am and I haven't got my credit yet. And it's been since December. Well, from what they told us is because I guess the facility was just got up and running in February. So they just started producing on the 28th of February. So this is really the first month that just came in. Okay. Yep. Any other, other questions? Thank you. Yep. Uh, you want to talk about guidance? Sure. Can we cost a buck? Are these the good ones or the bad ones? <laughs> they're, they're all over the office. Uh, so guidance. Um, I'm glad you noticed that. We noticed it as well. Uh, uh, so that's reported to the state, um, and so I worked with David, um, our technology person, and we picked apart uh, the staff that are uh, listed in that. I also worked with uh, Carol Hepworth, um, and what we recognized is that we think that um, we have three social workers in the district uh, that are listed in this line as fully general ed instructional staff, when in fact, uh, probably half their time is in special ed. Um, so uh, 1.5 uh, FTEs will come out of that guidance line uh, for instructional support, gen ed, and will be moved to another line. And so we're looking to see um, what that does to our comparisons to other districts. Um, with the caveat that in looking at guidance, we noticed that um, we had a reduction in administration, thanks to Bill. 
being a principal in two buildings, um, and that wasn't being reflected in the administrative line of, of the same report, and we noticed that we have an ETL, which is an evaluation team leader uh, who works in all of the buildings, listed as an administrator. Um, and so that uh, position needs to be moved um, and will be moved uh, into the line um, into the instructional support staff uh, slash diagnostic and evaluation. So those two things are um, will be represented in a correction that we make to the state report. But we won't know what it really means in terms of comparison to per pupil expenditure, which you noted. Okay. Right. With that being said, <laughs> another caveat <laughs> is that the school department and the school committee have made a substantial um, investment in social emotional learning of our students. Um, if you read the headlines, you're seeing um, trauma with our students, you're seeing the opioid ep epidemic, um, particularly here in Western Mass. Um, and so there's a recognition that students are coming um, really not as equipped to deal with the social pressure um, of the environment, uh, the technology, the devices, the bullying, and all of that. So there has been a commitment to increase the support um, for the social emotional well-being of our, of our students in Granby. Um, and so that, does, that, in my opinion, it's reflected in Granby's commitment and um, why we have higher uh, expenditure in that line. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm glad that uh, glad that you took a, a closer look at that. Not it doesn't do anything to your cost or keep right. your cost, but uh, it just seemed uh, unusual, mm -hmm. you know, for a small school district to, yes. uh, to do that. Absolutely. So quite a few of those costs are going to get transferred over to right. another system. And that's what we do as a leadership team. We look at that and we compare, you know, are, are we out of line really with other districts and why is that? And we try to tease that apart. Okay. Okay. Any questions? Um, this is not really in your budget, the next <laughs> one, but, but uh, we're kind of just kind of curious yeah. about, about what has happened with that. So I spoke with John Sullivan about this. I was not aware of it, so this was interesting uh, to me. Um, which, which question is this? This is the oil tank. The oil tank. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah it's it's not in your budget. <laughs> we probably want to, um, at least for the benefit of the camera and the folks who might watch this, just reiterate the question. Uh, a few years ago, um, the town voted on a special warrant article, uh, $120,000 uh, for uh, removal uh, of an oil tank uh, in the schools. And um, we haven't really heard whether or not that has happened or what the situation is or anything like that. So, and it's not, it's not an item in the school budget. So it really has nothing to do with the school budget, but it's the, the tank itself is in the school. So we're kind of curious about this. And there was some sort of a feeling that it needed to be done back at that point in time. Right, but it was appropriated. Yeah. It was appropriated, yeah. yeah. Right. In fact, there was that. the thought that maybe the money wasn't enough to take care of all the time. It was a little bit controversial. So I don't have an answer to that, but I did reach out to John Sullivan. Mm -hmm. um, his response um, was that that decision was prior to his arrival as well. So he has worked this year um, and part of last year sort of establishing uh, his knowledge of, of the town um, and the school department. Um, he, you know, stated that um, he understood that the money was allocated for the removal of an oil tank. I think it was an oil tank. I'm, I'm hoping that's a kind of oil tank at West Street. Um, but that we discussed with the closing of West Street School, uh, we have not moved forward with the removal, um, but that he would discuss it with the town in terms of um, incorporating it into uh, whatever is feasible during the decision of what the town is going to do with that um, building. So it might, st <coughs> it might still well have to happen. It's just that uh, it, it may be able to be put off until after it's no longer used in the school. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yep. So, I mean, this is just, again, ignorance on this. <laughs> I mean, when this happened, right, we were told flat out this had to be done, had to be done immediately, and all of this sorts of things. And I get you don't know, you weren't here, and so on. But the tank is still there and still being used, or was this the abandoned tank? Or I don't remember the details on the tank. Well, and it was yeah. the former facilities manager, right. I guess. That's my understanding. Right. So we have no idea what the status of all of this is. But 
it wasn't as alarmist as we heard in 2013. Obviously, I mean. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, I mean, none of you may have been around for it, but it was. I don't know if I remember it just from a town standpoint, or I, I can't recall if I was on the school committee. If you weren't there, then obviously I wasn't there. I was on the committee, but if it's 2013, I was, but I don't remember this one. So this is 120,000 to be credited back in. Well, it sounds like it sounds like it's going to get uh, used when something happens with Western. Western schools going to have to be sold, torn down, yeah, refurbished, yeah. whatever. Right. But none of that can happen in, until this oil tank is removed. Mm -hmm. But you may not need to remove the tank at the same kind of cost if you're demo. There's a demolition going on in the building, right? It's, Correct. It may be. But so you starting out with a credit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, what, that's my question. Yeah. Are you starting out with a credit or? It just disappeared. Right. Five million dollars, no, maybe $60,000. Yeah, it'll sit there at some point. Yeah. My recollection is it was more than just West Street School mm -hmm. because a former director was the one that made the presentation and somebody tried to pin, pin down what the actual cost to replace one was going to be. And the answer was because we don't know what we're going to find when we get down there. Mm -hmm. So there was a sum of money. But I think that it may also involve the stuff over at the high school. Right. In other words, it wasn't all allocated to West Street. It was some for over there. Mm -hmm. So, is there some detail on the Warren article that might help understand what he, what they were asking for? Must be there. Must be some details. That at least probably location would, wise, it would say it, but not, uh, probably not on the Warren article, but probably on um, on backups and <coughs> estimates that the that the school would have gotten. So, it would be the school. I don't think there were any estimates. Uh, yeah, it was just, this has to be done, it's a crisis. It was off the top of <laughs> yeah. the head. Yeah. And if, if I recall, I think John mentioned that um, Chris was working with the former facilities director to make sure it was done properly. Um, so I think that was, um, and I don't know when that former uh, facilities manager left, so that could be why it's sort of stalled. Okay. Thank you. Um, School choice. I think one of the, the primary questions was is that uh, from the budget we saw from April 24th uh, on the uh, cherry sheet from the state, the state estimates of money they're going to pay Granby, I think there's like $550,000 of school choice money. And your budget was using, I think, $475,000. Um, so. Correct. Yes, we reduced the budget because if you look on the cherry sheet, the 550 figure is the one that DESI uses that was their true up this December. Right. And as we know, this December true up was a $112,000 reduction in school choice. So looking at where we stand right now in the 550, we know we have 15 kids graduating at $5,000 a pop. That's $75,000 that we're not going to have for revenue next year. So by the time DESI gets around to truing up that number, which will be next December, when it goes down to 475, we'll already be at that in terms of anticipating it for the budget because we know those, those students are going to graduate. You know, the, the unknown is whether or not we'll gain a couple students or lose a couple students over the course of the summer. We don't know what that number is, but the 75000 in tuition from graduating students is a given. Can you tell us the status of, I think it was reported in the paper that there were 10, 11, 12, whatever number of students that you signed up for your recent events. Are those, those are presumably were new students. Uh, so what we have is interest. Uh, we have <coughs> parents that state interest um, in coming to Granby as school choice, um, but we do not uh, include those students um, in our revenue until the transfer of their records actually occurs um, and the students uh, enter the Granby Public Schools. So yes, we have um, 11, I think at this point, um, interest we have sent out um, uh, informational packets. Uh, I do believe we have uh, a percent of applications returned, um, and that starts the process for us to request records. So, so just timing-wise, how does this work, right? So you, you get a budget now with an amount allocated from the town for spending for next year before you know there's students coming in. Ten students, so we'll just use this as a round number, ten students decide in August they're coming to Granby. You get the revenue next year for those ten students, is that correct? Or, I mean, you don't wait a year to get that revenue, right? Correct. And so you have this amount allocated from the town. You get an extra 10 students with accompanying revenue. That just free revenue for the schools to spend then? Or how does that work in the budget process? 
for next year? Well, ideally, I mean, it could go either way. You could also lose students, which is what's been happening, you know, more recently. And then you have, a, you know, a then you'd be running a deficit. Off. And I get the right. deficit idea. I'm just wondering what happens with the extra revenue. I mean, the rev the revenue does accrue to the school, and it could be used for any school based purposes. I mean, I think obviously, you know, it's it's the superintendent and the school committee's call. But generally, if that kind of additional revenue wasn't needed to fund something else, like say another tuition that came into the school that you know would be funded without having to go to the town for additional money, I think one of the things would be to try to um, establish some of the uh, of the the revolving accounts that are, that you know, have been drained over the over the last five or six years, where you know when you used to have one year's worth of school choice or circuit breaker in your revolving accounts, when these students come in or you, these other things befall you, you can easily respond to it by just dipping into that and then next year you make it up with maybe additional revenue from school choice that comes in and you know you can get, you know everything's not a panic in terms of the budget when something when something comes up. Um, so likely if we would have that kind of fund so that we could all sleep at night for a change, that's mm -hmm. probably where we would we'd look to to put that right. so, like our stabilization. I was just no, 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 I hear that. Back but, to the town, just like when you were short, you should have come to the town. No, and I guess my, my question is, no. is slightly different that <laughs> that if you're imagining now budgeting, right, when you know if you have this different number of school choice kids in two months than we have now, how do you pick the number of school choice kids for the budget we're seeing right now? Since we don't know what that number is, and I get we don't know it, so the absence of it. How do you pick? I mean, there's got to be a number in the budget that you're presenting right now. Where did that number come from? Right. So at this point, it's the current enrollment and school choice, which equates to five hundred fifty thousand dollars because it's five thousand per student. But sometimes there's spend increments if they have any spend right. needs to them. Um, but we've reduced that by the graduating seniors that we know we won't have. So that's the seventy-five thousand dollars off. So our budgeting figure is not so much a student number as it is a dollar amount we expect to receive in revenue, and that's where we're coming up with our four seventy-five. Um, and from school choice that we allocate towards the school budget. So, so the current number is all the students currently in the system school choice in are assumed to be staying unless they're actually graduating. Mm -hmm. Any pickup of students just shows up as extra money. Any loss of students after that shows up we, as a reduction we don't revenue. Have the luxury of, of um, predicting figures. I, mean, I get, I get that. I'm just the budget position. That's that no, no, that, that's. I'm just. Yeah. I'm no, not I'm arguing an argument clear. here. I'm just. Yeah. I'm just being clear yeah. that ideally, if we were, it, it would be wonderful to be in that position yes. and make predictions. And and because we're running at such a deficit, that that's not one. Right. That's not an, a line item that we're willing to. And correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, but um, other towns, they don't use the current year's school choice funds this year. They actually. It's supposed to move forward, so that's what you use for those, you know, things that happen that you right. don't know are coming. So I mean, and that's what Mark's saying is, if that blessing happens, <laughs> then we would have those funds, like the stabilization fund, so that we wouldn't have to come back to the town. But we haven't been allowed to do that, to do that because the budget has been so tight. So, so but the budget being tight. So if you were to go back over time, right? So basically, you have a projection model that says the current students stay. And that's not going to be right. Some years you'll guess low, some years mm -hmm. you'll be guessed high. And again, I'm just wondering factually, how has that guess worked over time? I mean, have there been regularly more students than expected, less students expected? Does it bounce above and below that number if I were to go back 10 years? I have no sense of this. I mean, historically, the overall picture over the last 10 years for Grammy has been a decline in school choice um, students in. So, so so historically what we'd be seeing is you'd have a projected number you're not just losing the graduated because there'd be a decline in school choice because of the graduate i guess i'm wondering is the the expected going forward always guessing too high because you could get that decline in school choice because we just graduated we don't start as many new ones the following year but that wouldn't be your guess is wrong every year mm -hmm. is the guess historically too high well i, I think or do we know i mean you may not know right i mean I mean, when you're and when you're carrying a balance of a year's worth of school choice or a year's worth of circuit breaker, you don't have to be as as hectic in terms of trying to guess the number of students who are going to knock on your door. So I'll, I will tell you. I mean, I've not been here then, but I'm right. going to guess the prior business manager probably didn't have to worry about that too much because oh, you get thirty thousand dollars less in school choice. Well, you got six hundred thousand dollars in the bank, and maybe you'll make some up right. next year. But uh, you know, now we're trying to go to the best estimate we can, but that's probably a little different. 
than the way it was looked at in the past. No, and I think I, I'm just trying to ask this sort of question. Anyway, probably for me, it's I'll be honest, right? I've learned more about the school budget from the school committee in this discussion than in the previous nine years I've been on this committee asking questions. So <laughs> I cannot tell you how much I appreciate this immensely. So this is purely, I'm going to take advantage of this and figure out what's going on. <laughs> so that next year when you, you've all left <laughs> and I go back to my status quo, right? I can say, well, at least for a brief moment, I can figure out what was going on. So, so my question is this. So you got a projection, you know, use around 100 students that you're projecting going forward into the year, right? There should be, it should be an easily discovered number of, with that projection of 100 going forward, has that historically been too high that you only had 95 the following year? Or did you have 105? Or does it bounce around? And that would get to your point of we may be able to get a better guess at that number if we knew that well, projecting that is just a little off all the time. So let's say this, all things being equal, we would probably have to look at um, a reduction as well in the number of school choice children um, coming in. So in addition to the graduation, right. probably a reduction as well. With the things that the administration has been trying to do, number one, we're hopeful that we can at least keep that neutral or maybe turn right. that to the positive. The other thing too is we're already talking about a huge amount of money um, over and above what is typically given. So again, you know, if we estimate conservatively <coughs> but lower, that just increases the gap that we're looking for. Oh, so we're trying to, you know, just kind of keep that as yeah. But your as estimate, as your estimate assumes zero kids coming in. The way you're making that Addition. estimate, Addition. yeah, you're assuming yes. zero kids yes. coming Addition. in. So yes. any kid coming in is always a plus, right? So if any Correct. kids start in kindergarten, that's always a plus on this budget, Correct. right? So then it's the how many kids are coming into kindergarten minus how many of the kids that were here this year decided not to come back is the real number we're comparing right. year to year. And I have no sense of those numbers, but that would have a huge effect then on sort of a bouncing around, which would then would lead to a lot of frustration by a school committee that... These numbers are not what we're predicting, and it's nice in the good years, but you don't notice it because you felt so bad about the bad years kind of thing. And that's pretty pretty much why we deal in actuals. Yeah. We don't deal in projections when it comes to school choice. But the school, we yeah. just don't know. Well, the school choice year number is a prediction, right? I mean, it, it's, it's you're, an you're implicit prediction of you're predicting right? the kids you're are going to stay. Yes. Yeah. There's no way around it. Yeah. You have to have a prediction yeah, there. they're current students. Exactly, right. So, yes. So you have to have a prediction. It's as good a prediction as any I'm going to come kind of up with, but it would be good to know how good that prediction is right. for planning purposes going forward, just sort of thinking about the... And, and this is that point John brought up earlier. In the old days when the school budget was just the state minimum plus 305, whatever, the school committee absorbs it in their stabilization fund, right? And that was a great system from the standpoint of the town. The school gets extra revenue, they put in a stabilization fund, they lose revenue, they take it out, and there's no feedback mechanism. But as we start getting to, well, if that's not going to work and we need trade-offs between the school and the town, suddenly I get a lot more interested in, okay, how, how firm is this number? Because we're not writing a contingent budget because the other way to do this is here's the amount you can spend contingent on school choice if the school choice comes in you don't get to spend anymore all that money just comes back to the town but if you lose the school choice kids the town has to kick more money in that would be another way to fund the schools right and then you don't absorb the variation in it. you don't get the benefit you don't absorb the cost and if this number was bouncing around a lot that would be the kind of thing that would be worth thinking about going forward is that the way we want to do it maybe, down, yeah. maybe down the road I, I would agree with that when yeah. we stabilize and, and some of these programs have been in effect for a, a bit longer than a year and we are more confident in our marketing skills in, in bringing more school choice kids in. I would agree with that. And now that we have a little bit of stability as well. Yes. I mean, but I think we're not there yeah. yet. I, I, I understand. Well, the town's yet. not there yet either, let's be clear. <laughs> well, so. But I think one of the other impacts of school choice too that we have to realize is um, not only are we not as attractive in um, bringing students in to replace students that started many, many years ago um, as kindergartners and now are graduating, we actually have families making the choice to choice out. Right. And that's very difficult to predict um, because when we have these discussions, it's hard to understand how a family may take something that we've said and think, wow, that's really going to impact the choice that my child has. So I'm actually going to now think about moving you know, to another district. Um, and so we have um, a coming together. We have you know, less students coming in, but more students leaving. And so that's what we're trying to stabilize and actually go back um, and uh, correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Cheryl, correct me if I'm wrong. Also, you know, as we were discussing earlier, you, you, before you uh, came in, Jim, when there's so much reduction in staff, 
right. the reason why we wanted to this year say 96 in the course of you know so many years it's not going to happen immediately but that when there's so much reduction in staff then everybody becomes much more reluctant to even commit to new students coming in because you already reduced the number of teachers that you can uh, you can have for mm -hmm. these for these students so that was almost uh, you know a situation where there was no way out and what Cheryl said added to it in the past this was a very strong net uh, positive school choice district which still is but uh, much smaller net positive and there was no such thing as folks leaving the district at the rate we have seen so the unpredictability that comes from both sides mm -hmm. that was really detrimental uh, to the planning process right. mm -hmm. And if I could just make a, a quick point about how, you know, the decisions at the school and the school choice in and out can really affect the budget. You know, at the, I know, I, the, you know, the 305 override that has traditionally been granted to the schools, which is, which is great and appreciated. When you look at that, that figure, and I think everybody looks at it in town, it's like, wow, that's a lot of money. The school choice out uh, payment that gets charged back to the school through the in-kind last year was 302. So when you think about the 305 that came in. 302 went out in school yeah. choice. But the school choice out is an interesting number because what you really want is the net school choice, which is still a positive, right? And, if, and But how big of a positive is it? I mean, what is that rough number if you just say net school choice? It's the 550 minus three, 320. So 200,000. So we're not talking this is a giant percentage of your budget. That's the other thing we're thinking. In other words, this number bounces around. You're talking maybe 100000 here or there. Is that about right, out of a $10 million budget? Right. But in terms yeah. of discretionary income, that could be a lot of money. No, it's, it's nice to have an extra $100,000. I get that, right? <laughs> then not. But but this isn't like 10% of your budget swing. This is a 1% budget swing. Is that... Do you have a measure of, on the school <laughs> choice students out, how many or what percentage of them are going to other districts versus how many of them are going to private schools? Mm -hmm. Yes. What else? How does it break down? <laughs> That's the right question. Oh, there are a lot of interesting things that have been coming up here at this meeting. As Jim um, said, we're going to take this opportunity to find out what we can. <laughs> Off the top of my head, while Marie gets the spreadsheet that we created uh, for that, I believe we have 51 students uh, that are currently going to McDuffie. Um, that was the result of um, uh, a very strong recruiting effort uh, on McDuffie's part uh, when they moved from Springfield to Granby and took over the old um, home, yeah, um, Catholic school. Um, and he was very, um, uh, very transparent with that. Um, we had a talk uh, about that um, and the fact that there is a tuition reduction, reimbursement, yeah, or scholarships. We actually right. did a calculation once that we took all the school budget, added in the Granby, so you can the Granby scholarship. We can send every kid in, in town to McDuffie. Wow. <laughs> Except for the state reimbursement. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so he was not aware, apparently, that we had so many students going there. And so we talked about, you know, what impact that has on a district a student population size of Granby um, and his work moving forward in their recruiting process now that they're stable um, and they're recruiting day students um, and going through, you know, all of the towns that are uh, neighbors to them and not just um, cherry picking uh, Granby students. Um, so they can have a really good girls soccer team. Um, we so. had a very frank discussion with um, the representative at one of our school committee meetings and we followed it up with a couple of other frank discussions. Just, you know, the impact that it was beginning, that it has had. So, I mean, we addressed it. And I do think it's important to understand, you know, that McDuffie is a private school um, and as such, they only accept a caliber of student that they feel demonstrates um, right. what they represent. Um, so, you know, while we may um, think about, wouldn't it be great if we could, you know, tuition our kids there, they are not going to accept the majority of our students. Mm -hmm. um, right. So, I think we have to be cognizant of that. What is it that public schools provide to the community in which they are embedded? So, um, we also have, uh, I believe, about um, 26 students school choosing to Belchertown and uh, 20 to South Hadley. I may be having the reversed. Um, so it's roughly 50-50? 
or, or South End Belchtown, I yes. assume yeah. to right. be the bulk um, of them. I think one of the things we noticed when we started looking at the uh, school choice numbers were the increase in elementary school students leaving. Uh, we typically saw um, historically high school students making the transition at very typical grade levels, sixth grade to go to middle school, eighth grade going into high school. So your very standard um, grade levels where, where families would make a decision. Now what we see, um, I think as representative of some of the budget um, discussion and reduction discussions that we have to have is uh, people are making those decisions at second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and those hadn't happened. Um, and so trying to understand why um, families are making those decisions at elementary school level um, is important as well. I think the new school might change that? Well, we're, and so when we talk about a plan, that's what we're hoping. And you know, so you talk about budget, how do you budget for that? I don't know right. how to budget for that. Are we going to recapture 46 families of Granby, you know, come back to the district? What does that represent in terms of funding? Um, we won't have that number until the school buildings open. Um, one of the things we're very excited about is our grade three through six students will have one-to-one -one, um, technology. So they'll walk in and they'll have a device that's devoted to them for their entire school day. Um, and uh, teachers will be getting professional development and writing curriculum and um, new engaging lessons uh, around technology. The infrastructure will be there for students and teachers to use 24-7. Uh, so that's a huge, um, real, I, I think, gift that the town has given uh, the students and the school department. Um, it's something that we need to capitalize on. Um, um, I don't know where my arm was going. <laughs> what time is it? I don't my chocolate it? shake is I wearing really off. <laughs> Cheryl, I don't have a February folder in, in, my, in my drive. Okay. Well, that's about I, it. I just can't a, get it's, on. it's probably 50 50. I think it is around 50 50. Mm -hmm. But what Cheryl was saying, just to re emphasize that, in the past when we saw students go into, say, Belcher Town, South Hadley, primarily you knew that it was related to athletics. Mm -hmm. There wasn't something here, just they wanted to, uh, to do it there. Uh, recently, and this is the last, what, six, seven years, the departures were not just for athletic purposes. And we tried to, in fact, individually, which I mentioned earlier, tried to reach out to some of the families that we know to understand. And some of them said, you know, there was some uh, sports that uh, Granby didn't have at the time. And some said we weren't sure about the future of the high school and we wanted to move our uh, students out of the district uh, when we could. Uh, but the biggest impact that came to us was from the uh, from the private school from McDonald's. Okay. And to, also, to does you have Cheryl's point, um, you know, losing the best and brightest is not is not what we want. We don't want that trend to continue. You know, losing students to school choice and um, private schools. We want our classrooms enriching environments, and that means that. You know, we want the best and brightest in those classrooms as well. But aren't you, aren't the challenges of competing against uh, a private school much different from the challenges of competing against another you know, school system? For sure, and we we understand that. We understand that there's going to be a certain percentage of students that we're going to lose no matter what that will make the choice to go to a private school. That's the reality of it. But the numbers that we're talking about, they were skewed. They they were they were far too high, and you know. And, and I think one of the things to recognize as well is that uh, Granby is not isolated in its budget woes. Um, you're, if you read the paper, you're reading about other towns that are struggling with these same types of questions. I feel like Granby's a little bit of the canary in the coal mine because we're a little bit ahead in terms of we have been using historically our revolving accounts to pay general operating um, budget expenditures. Um, instead of enriching the program for students. Um, and so we are at the point where there is no more revolving account. Um, so what you're seeing is, if you look at school committee decisions around budget, you're starting to see, well, we'll just, we'll, we'll dip into, dip into our revolving accounts for this year. So what is the, what is the reaction? Oh, but we'll open up school choice seats. So now you have a Belcher town that's starting to open up seats in elementary school because they have declining enrollment, like everybody else. They've got room in their classrooms. They see school choice as a revenue. And so now there's a lot more in this area of families seeing opportunities that really weren't there before. And you know, I've been talking to the legislature about what the unintended consequences of school choice are. 
School choice was intended to allow families in low-performing, underperforming districts an opportunity of an education in a system that was a level one. It was never intended for a level one or a level two family uh, student in a level one or level two district to then go make a choice. And, and so there's been, you know, I think there needs to be some education as to what has happened as a result of school choice. But, but um, I think, I mean, I, I get that, and there's an interesting public policy question. But right. let's be clear, Granby benefits from it even in the current world. And I think part oh, of the rhetoric here is if we could have all the students come in and yep. none of our students will leave, we'd be better off. That's true, right? I mean, it'd be great. Yeah. Everybody oh, just send their kids here and we don't I'm go out. Right? Yeah. Benefit. So, we yeah. hugely. We're still benefiting. Fitting, let's be clear, million. right? And I think that's yeah. where you can't just talk about the kids going out when we've got more kids coming in, right? The kids going out aren't a net loss since we have more kids coming in. We're better off with this thing. It is, though. It, because if you're still losing students from your own district... Right, but that's that presumption that all kids in Granby should want to go to the Granby school and all kids in other districts should also want to go to the Granby school, right? What's wrong with that? <laughs> <What's> wrong with <laughs> it, it sounds nice, but then if I were sitting down with the Belchertown School Committee, they're going to say all kids in Belchertown should want to go to the Belchertown school and all kids from out of it should come in. In, in and the so. Berkshires and in, in, um, Mohawk Regional, I think, is a good example. They have actually looked at school choice and said, this is not a way for us to be sustainable exactly. as a community. Exactly. Right. So they've had that difficult conversation. John, where we have the question? Oh, sorry. Uh, I got a, a, there were all kinds of school <coughs> choice questions. This is a, a, a little bit related to it. Um, the situation across all school districts is that the school population is decreasing. Uh, so that all of a sudden everybody is going to have room in their schools. Um, the natural assumption, and I think Mark stated earlier, would be that we'd assume that the number of school choice students would go down in any district. On the other hand, um, it's been stated that you'd like to pull in, to double the number of school yep. choice students to 98. And those, those two statements are not easily reconcilable, that there's going to be more choices everywhere and the number of school students is going to decrease to doubling our number of school choice students. Um, so I'd kind of like to hear your, your view on that, but along with the following, um, you may disagree, but there's a, an old maxim which is taught to all economists who go to work for companies when you're asked to make a prediction about the future. Give them a number or give them a date, but never both. And we notice that you've got a number here of 98 students, but there's no date, and except that you said that you don't expect more next year, you expect less. So uh, could you please try to tell us how these things fit together? Not all at once. <laughs> so, you know, we have been um, thinking about this year um, how we can create a sustainable school department. Um, and school choice is a portion of the answer to that, as is uh, sustainable funding. Um, so the school committee certainly um, investigating ways to um, have a sustainable uh, revenue source for us. But specific to school choice, um, what we looked at um, were the current classrooms that we have um, and uh, created numbers that had the most impact in terms of being able to bring students in, uh, whether those would be students returning to us or students from other districts, um, without increasing uh, class size um, uh, to the point where we would need another teacher. Um, so um, the goal would be um, we, we presented this at school committee. Um, so for kindergarten, we opened up 10 seats. Do you want to get into this detail? Well, I think the, 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 the real question is, is demographics say we're going to have decreasing population, no getting around it. Mm -hmm. What's the long-term strategic thinking about that for you guys? Right. It's, it's not so much that you figured out you're going to have this many seats here and this many seats there. It's really the question is, realistically, how do we have a chance at filling those seats right. when every other school is going to be in the same position and right. so, going to have a school right. committee thinking the same thing? So if we have, for example, 46 students leaving and that's a significant increase, if we cut that in half and we keep 20 students, that's minimum right. limit school spending increase, right? It's chapter right. 70 increase. Right. Um, and then we add 20 of, you know, uh, these seats. You know, we're looking at, if we were to do that, uh, 40, four, 
four hundred eighty thousand um, dollars, which is a significant part of the deficit that we see recurring mm -hmm. uh, year after year. Now, you know, how do you do that? You create great programming. You know, you you are the small district that people want to come to. Um, so when we talk about um, how do we attract students and what's the plan, those are the times when we start having discussions about why are students leaving. They may be leaving for um, the fact that we don't have electives uh, that we used to offer, things like drama, fine arts. Um, so taking some of the revenue and reestablishing those programs um, so that we are keeping the more, hopefully more than 20 students that are leaving our district that are Granby residents, um, get that number up to 30. Um, I look at Avon um, as a comparative district, uh, certainly not in terms of uh, economic uh, revenue capacity, um, but certainly in terms of the number of students and the numbers of schools. Mm -hmm. so they lose 12 kids. So the long-term strategic plan is to build a qualitatively better program? Yeah. All right. Yeah, and that was I mean, they think their one of our other questions was right. uh, where does Granby currently compare qualitatively? We've done we've done a boatload of quantitative analysis, but we never heard anything from you folks in terms of qualitative analysis. Where does Granby compare qualitatively right. in terms of other school districts like us? Right. So I think um, at the elementary school we have a an extremely strong program. Uh, we are known for our elementary program. Continue to be known for that. Um, I think where there is a perception um, is at the junior senior high school because of the reductions um, that started uh, a few years ago where we started to have to reduce um, health, uh, we had to start to reduce our electives, our fine arts, our music. Um, so those are the kinds of athletics. athletics. We didn't offer as many. Um, we don't offer middle school athletics anymore. Mm -hmm. So we try to work with what we have, but those are the little pieces that chip away at a family's decision. Uh, whether or not we are offering um, everything comparatively. I mean, great organizations get great because they focus on one thing, one thing only. Yeah. You know, they're niche marketing. Um, is the answer here, we're going to be the best, you know, basically elementary and middle school, but then make a decision otherwise about the high school? Is that the long-term strategic no. plan? Or, and if not, <laughs> then how are we going to fund that and how are you going to do it? So I think what we're really saying yeah. is we want to be qualitatively better at everything, which doesn't always work. No, I think that um, our core instructional program and what we offer in terms of AP coursework, um, honors coursework, standard level uh, coursework, um, certainly meets a high standard of expectation. Uh, it is beyond that that we start to see reductions impact. So how do we how do we compare now ranking wise to other schools? Well, it wasn't a question, so I, I can't tell you. <laughs> in terms of what Western Mass, in terms the of the Commonwealth, or well, let's let's say let's say Western Massachusetts. What, what are we comparing? First yeah, are we? Com yeah. School ranking. I'm not sure that there's actually there's a school, really ranking. Isn't a school mm -hmm. ranking. Or a level two. I disagree I mean, with your philosophy that we. Oh no, no, no it's not philosophy. That, that I'm not. I'm not. I'm not making a well, philosophical statement. Maybe the word is incorrect, but I yeah. respectfully disagree that we can't be qualitatively. Well, you might very well be. Exceptional across the board. I mean, this is what the school department. You might. You might. You might. You might. You might very well for. be <coughs> if you strategically plan for it. Most most organizations I've seen though get to be great because they focus on one thing, one thing only. That's all. I, I would also disagree with that. Um, just for an example, I just had to do a doctoral research on the United States Postal Service and their five-year strategic plan. And if you look at their five-year strategic plan, they are not focusing on one thing and one thing only. They're focusing on about five steps that are supposed to make them better and make them more sustainable because, as you know, the government has undercut everything that they need to do because they have to pre-fund their health care system. Um, so we do have a strategic plan that we've been working on. And working on one thing and one thing only might be good for some companies, but this is education. Yeah. So it's a totally different thing. Um, you know, parents, I, I'm a parent, and my son is, is out of school now, but if I were looking at a different school, I would be looking at many things not just sports or not just their academic program but the culture and what's happened in the past because we've had so much turnover and there wasn't stability 
is that culture got eroded and morale got eroded. And so parents started going, I'm not so sure. And that's why you're starting to see, even, because, even with the population, we would have more, more kids here had that part not happened. Right. But do you have a benchmark of qualitative comparison? No one does. That's, that it's really, well, parents it's, are making a decision about to go or to stay. So the parents are, in essence, intuitively at least, making a decision that this school system is better than that school system. It's all about perception. Yeah. Aren't you going to have to have some kind of measure if you're going to convince people I mean, we have the state better? accountability reports. Right. Um, and so certainly parents will benchmark us as a level two. Um, but if you look, Belchertown and South Hadley are level two. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, as is East Long Meadow. Um, it doesn't take but one level two school in your district to be a level two as opposed to a level one. Right. So, but what, so what are the qualitative benchmarks that you're going to be building to? Okay, so at, now I think I see where you're going. So one of the things we do to measure um, effectiveness of our program uh, are the types of colleges that kids get into. So we mm -hmm. are uh, basically a college prep. Mm -hmm. um, we do um, investigate Pathfinder for many of our students who want a vocational education. Um, but one of the things we measure also are um, entrance exam or placement exams. And so if we have students that are going uh, to HCC and uh, test into non-credit bearing coursework, that's a measure for us as to the um, the rigor of our program because any child coming out of Granby that goes to HCC stick really should be entering as a freshman as a credit bearing freshman mm -hmm. um, so that is a measure certainly um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head other measures of uh, we use uh, participation in athletics and uh, co-curriculars um, as an indication um, and one of the things that we look at um, and, and speak about is, you know, one of the benefits of Granby is being able to participate um, because we are small. We have almost two thirds of our students participating in co-curricular athletics every season. When you go to Belchertown with 2,500 students, I'm not sure how many are at the high school, the likelihood of you making a varsity or JV team is greatly reduced. Mm -hmm. So we have very successful sport teams, drama clubs, many students participating. So I would say that would be a measure. Mm -hmm. um, and so as we start to see kids um, not participating, that would be something that we mm -hmm. would have to intervene with. Um, I think a measure for us are the increases in AP coursework, the numbers of students taking AP courses, but also the number of students um, earning qualifying scores. Mm -hmm. um, so that program would be an indicator for us and mm -hmm. something that we measure. Now with all that being said, a change in administration at the high school will bring all that to uh, the okay. table. Is there a sense of where we stand on those measurements now? There's a sense uh, of where we are in terms of uh, understanding Granby, but we haven't taken it to the next step in terms of comparing okay. us to, uh, but it's a fair and question, it absolutely is. And uh, I was going to say as well, it's one of the things the school committee talks about each time is really looking at what are we good at, what do we think we're better at than, than maybe other towns, and how do we market that mm -hmm. so that parents will know, because one of the things that we haven't been good at in the past, and even before my time, is telling anybody what we do well. Everybody hears the complaints, right? Everybody hears the bad stuff. Everybody hears the budget cuts. But there are many great things that are happening in our schools, and we're learning as a committee now. These are important to make sure that we're talking about, and that's how we will begin to measure those benchmarks even better. Yeah, no, I mean, do you have any money built into the budget for next year for any of this? Uh, really, it's the work of leadership, so um, yeah, I guess there isn't anything. Are there, are there are there specific programs or plans that you've set out that you developed? So we have a leadership this? retreat um, every year in the summer, um, and so we take a look at the strategic plan, um, and then uh, the district improvement plan, which filters down to the school improvement plans, and get that vertical alignment. Um, so then we're assessing and creating all of our professional development, all of our curriculum writing, all around those goals. Are there benchmarks associated with these plans? Are there benchmarks associated no, with these plans? Um, no, is there, a, is there a goal? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I guess the, the, I mean, what I liked about sort of your benchmark thing, you know, it's kids not having to take remedial classes in community colleges, right? Mm -hmm. I and mean, we're not talking remedial class at Harvard, we're talking remedial class at HCC, right, or AP. But what's interesting about those kinds of measures is 
they hinge on the quality of your teacher. Mm -hmm. More money doesn't fix that. If a kid has to go to HCC and take remedial class, that's because your math teacher did a horrible job. And no amount of money is going to fix the fact that the math teacher didn't actually teach math in the math course, or the social studies teacher didn't teach social studies, or things like that. And I know you, because of union contracts or so on, can't fix the teaching staff quickly and easily. But I guess I'm wondering if you were talking about the number of problems, you know, even the school choosing out to mm -hmm. McDuffie, right? It's the it's like the elephant in the room all the time, right? You don't you have some teachers that aren't very good is a nice way to put it, right? You 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 know you, you won't say that on camera. I get I'll say that on camera, right? You have some teachers who aren't very good, and no amount of money spent on the schools is going to fix the problem of some teachers that aren't very good. And then parents seeing, well, the teacher isn't very good, didn't teach math, the kid had to go take the remedial class. Again, no amount of money is going to fix that. And I guess I'm trying to wrap my mind around. You spend more money on sports teams, you spend more money on this, but you still have some teachers at the center of the program who aren't actually teaching the material. How does this help? So, so one of the things that, you know, when we talk about reductions in budget and you look at the comparisons to other districts, if you look at our PD line, um, we are well under um, the average or of our comparison districts. I think, I, I can't find the cheat sheet, but I think we have, of our per pupil expenditure, I want to say like, ten dollars is, is given towards professional development where in other districts a much larger percentage up to fifty or sixty dollars per student is spent on professional development last year we had to um, again in a budget reduction uh, we had to eliminate team leaders uh, so these are your uh, uh, teachers that uh, create um, through empowerment change in instruction well, if they're not there and, and they're not um, able to do that, then you start to have teachers working in isolation, teachers mm -hmm. not getting professional development, teachers not feeling support, the culture and the climate starts to, you know, starts to unravel a little bit. Um, and so that's an impact of the budget reductions. Um, it, it's so, partly so that. Let me, yeah. I'd like to make this point that this all goes back to, I mean, this is the catch-22, even to your point asking if we had some um, a line item in the budget for marketing. We've talked many times about, boy, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could actually budget some, some funds for a marketing campaign. And you know, we talk endlessly about how do, we, um, how do we have metrics so that we can determine mm -hmm. the success of students and how we're doing. And that costs money. <laughs> At the end of the day, it costs money, and we don't have the funding to get to that next level. So you see that, the, you know, this is part of the vicious cycle that we continually talk about. And we're constantly putting Band-Aids on, well, how can we go around this? How can we figure out a way to achieve the goal despite well, well, the one way is, as Chris pointed out by sitting here tonight, is if it's a one-shot deal, come to the town, you know, at the appropriate time. To be honest with you, I've been on the school committee now. This is my fourth year. I was not aware of that. Me neither. So, you know, I don't. Well, I um, can't pretend to say how well, I didn't know that. I just, I didn't know that. Bring your hat. There are two. There are two different things. What? Bring your hat in your hand. <laughs> I didn't. But I don't know what I don't know. I think there are two different things which are being talked about. Um, let me give you the analogy with. Uh, way, the way uh, town departments operate and also the way the school department has operated in, in the past for some things. Um, each year uh, there are two mechanisms which are built into the whole process of spending. One is that at the annual town meeting uh, a certain amount of funds are voted into a reserve fund. Uh, it's generally in the $130,000 range. A small percentage of what the total budget is. And the reserve fund allows departments to do this, and it's written under the bylaws, and I think the way a reserve fund has to work is that if an expense comes up which is unexpected, unexpected, and unbudgeted, and if that expense comes up and you cannot make room in your budget for that expense through shifting other things around, then you're allowed to come to the finance committee and ask for their consideration to transfer additional budget money to your budgets. Now, this is small amounts of money, generally, 
usually under $15,000 because there's only 130000 all together. The other mechanism is <clears throat> if something happens, and these are usually capital items, and it's where the schools have used both the reserve fund and have used town meetings, <clears throat> is that there are special town meetings at different points of the year. They're not planned in advance, but they occur during the year. And a department can come to the special town meeting and ask special town meeting to allocate more money to their budget because of these unexpected things that happen. It's not allowed, it's, it's unlikely that uh, you get a good hearing if there's something which is part of your overall plan and you just leave it unbudgeted. <laughs> you know, right. It is really for unexpected things. It's, it's, really, it's really to uh, say that the town is not a heartless entity. You know, there, everybody knows there are unexpected things happened. Uh, in a family, if that happens, you've got to get your resources that you have and, and figure out a way to pay for it. The town's resources are uh, these funds that are in, uh, in the stabilization funds and these funds that are in the reserve funds. And so there's a mechanism there to do that. But it, it doesn't, it's not intended to be for something which is an ongoing expense. What did you say, the 130000 Reserve, reserve fund. Reserve, reserve fund. The, the one thing I would say, and this is, I, this is not to blame anybody because, to be honest, I was new and learning. But back in the Isabelina days, when unexpected special ed things would come up and we would come to the town. So this is my first and second year, and I was still learning, and I don't, and I don't always know what's going on. You know, I was still learning municipal finance as well. It seemed to me that there was a negative. It, there they come asking for money again. So when, so what I learned from that was it's not good to ask for money mid-year. Well, you know, can you see? Can you see <coughs> where? Well, that, that, that also you've got to remember is is mm -hmm. the philosophy was you handle the budget. We never saw a budget from the school committee until last year. I, I, under, I let understand. Let me let me bring up a let me bring up a different point. But I mean, um, can you understand where? where yeah, but let me. Oh, let no, me no, let, I, yes, I understand, and I think it goes both ways, right? I think the other thing with the Isabelina years, uh, we'd sit down and ask a question, you and there was you? never an answer to a question, right? And there was certainly never an answer that was consistent over a six-month time period. That was not a good time, right? And it, it followed a time that also wasn't a good time. I mean, I'm not kidding when I say this has been vastly more productive meeting than any of the other times we have ever sat down with a school committee to try to sort things out. And so, yes, I completely get why you would have gotten that impression, because it would have been the impression, because... In those years, if somebody the town were the school were to come to the town with a budget request, it would not be clear what they were even asking for, right? It would have been impossible to piece through. You would break your promise three years in a row. Yeah, yeah. There's another. There's another point here, and that um, what I said about the budgets and being able to ask for extra money involved um, something unexpected, right. something unbudgeted and something for which you didn't have a way to shift money around within your budget. And uh, years ago, uh, with town departments, not school departments, coming and asking for uh, money from the reserve fund, uh, sometimes as early as September, we would get people coming and asking for $1,000 from the reserve fund. So we, we finally just let it be known that these things happen earlier in the year. You pay for them. You pay for them. Keep track if it was an unexpected expense. Keep track of it. And then when we get into the springtime and you have a better sense, and with a small budget, you need that amount of time to have a better sense. You need a better sense of what's going on in your budget. Then come and ask if, for us if you need additional money. Well, with the schools, um, schools have got more money than the town's got. <laughs> the budget is you know, huge compared to the town. And so... Uh, the combination of the size of that budget plus the fact that in past years you've always had some pretty good size revolving funds mm -hmm. and it always made it that yeah this is unexpected yeah it wasn't budgeted for but come on you know you can find you can find ten thousand dollars in your budget now yeah i can't find two hundred fifty thousand dollars perhaps but you can find ten thousand dollars someplace among those combination of, of things so i think that's why um, that's why uh, it's one of the reasons why uh, a hard approach was taken, I think, towards a lot of the items. But I think this is good because we're we can start to understand yeah. where we're all coming mm -hmm. from. I mean, if if, if it's you know we need ten thousand for a pilot program for marketing, you know, that's a different discussion. I mean, I think you would be well served when you present for your override 
is to lay out the strategy you've given us tonight mm -hmm. of our game plan is to qualitatively improve the schools mm -hmm. and be such a qualitative benchmark level that we will attract in mm -hmm. uh, basically parents and students that basically want to live in this community. Mm -hmm. And We're already working on it. Increase We've been working on it for Which, months. But, but, that, but, but, but that story in the next year. Yeah, but that story is a compelling story, which would be mm -hmm. great to present in terms of your request for an override. Which is a story, frankly, which we never heard till tonight. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't mean it hasn't been. No, but uh, it's no, all but communication. I know what he's saying. It's been. <laughs> <laughs> going back to what you were, you were, I think both of you were asking about. We've been having these conversations for for a while now. In fact, a few years ago, you know, with all the AP conversations and STEM conversations, we brought people in to see how we can really restructure uh, how we're approaching uh, certain things, and especially on the high school side, to be seen as this college prep type of uh, school. Not necessarily because we thought everybody would go to college, but at least cater to the needs uh, of students that were expressed at the time. So I'm, I really like the questions that you're asking, but what we realized eventually was the fact that, and it's the first thing on our current strategic plan if you look at it, we realized that there was such dramatic change at the leadership level, year after year after year that, unless you stabilize that, mm -hmm. anything that you started doing this year, talk about the institutional knowledge and all that stuff. The next person comes in, just you know, wants to do something different, but doesn't know what this one started. So the first one was stabilize leadership. Mm -hmm. And that's why it is probably, you know, it sounds like fluff to some folks who, you know, hear us say these things. This year, our biggest hope or biggest uh, celebration is the fact that finally a leadership team is coming together that will be working together to really do those things. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I could have given you, you know, the AP example, the college prep example, the after school programs that we started, the social emotional learning programs, uh, uh, supporting some of the uh, core programs at the both at the elementary level and uh, the high school level. But unless you have consistency and stability, mm -hmm. those things go any which way. I agree completely, but this is another time when I think, you know, the school committee is having one discussion and then you how does it sound with the outsider? You're talking about a stability leadership team. You just fired or let go or quit the principal of the high school, right? This does not sound to me the outsider like, look, we've got stability in a leadership team. I mean, it may be a huge improvement in a leadership team, but but those are the kinds of ways that I think the lack of the seeming transparency and conversation from the outside looks like, what are you guys talking about, right? right? I hear what you're saying. Stable leadership is good, right? And all these sorts of things. Yeah. But, but I think Rob's trying be, to hit. You can only be so transparent. No, I, I get you can't be transparent. And, you know, and I'm not asking you tell me what happened to, to the principal, right? But but I guess the, the, the question here is this sort of, you're going to go to the town and ask for an override, which is what we I've been saying. You know, we've all been saying for years, go to the town. But in making that case to the town, there's one line of rhetoric, which is, we're underfunded, the mean people in town don't want to do this, this is just awful, which is what it sounds like year after year to me, right? I'm sitting there and feeling like here I am being blamed again. And then there's another way, which is what I've been trying for nine years to convince a school committee. Here's what the schools will look like without this money, and it's a low steady state, right? There is a way to operate a school on the existing budget. It won't be the school you all imagine, it's not the school you want, but it is possible to operate a school on it. And then here's what the school would look like with the extra money. And then you lay it out. And then you're basically putting forward that choice of, do you want the low level school or do you want the high level school? That comes across way more persuasive than, oh, we just need more money, we just need more money. I mean, in just other words, it will persuade people like me to vote for something with that kind of an articulation in ways that just blaming people because we don't have enough money is not persuasive to those outside the circle. Yeah. Believe so, me, that, 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 sounds, that sounds very good when we're having these conversations, but you know, it's, if experience shows anything, it shows that when you start having those conversations uh, at the, at the uh, uh, town meeting or you know, with folks who are really curious about where the school district is going because they're about to make a, a serious decision about the future of their kids, it's not really as easy as that. Because when you have to tell somebody that, you know what, my options are as easy as a uh, school that has almost nothing, bare bones, versus a school where your child can prosper because I'm going to be offering these things. 
unless you can tell which one it is, those people are going to just say, you know what, you're telling me that your direction is going in uh, towards this uh, basic, very basic one. And I'm not sure that we can get any more basic. In fact, that's, we have been, we have been, and I'm saying we because now we're at a point where we really feel some ownership because we've been working on something together for the last so many years. We have been trying to make sure that even though the funds were not really what you would expect to have to be able to put programs like this, we were able to put in place certain things that could not have been possible unless everybody agreed and everybody put their heads together. I mean, you know, something that sounds as simple as a social emotional learning uh, program, which probably a lot of school districts may be taken for granted. It was meeting after meeting, trying to determine why and how and what that would bring. And it was biting the bullet. Last year, I think when we first mentioned it to you guys, the, the expectation was three to four. Or I think you mentioned four, just uh, we were thinking, you know, if we can bring four students to this, at least show that there is value in this, and then it's, it's seven. If we can keep up with things like that, we, our hope is that we're gonna actually see traction see improvements. But when we tell people that, you know what, again, we're cutting this year, uh, and next year we're not going to have this and that, while we're trying to deal with this new thing and trying to gain traction here, those folks who were here for the other programs, they say, you know what, I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting out of here. Just, you know, my child is not going to be happy here. My child will not get what uh, he or she wants. That's what we're trying to prevent this year and next year with a couple of expectations. One is we're hoping that if we can show that whatever we try to put in place is really working or starting to show promise that it is working, that's one. Number two, if all the stars align and fiscal year 2020, some semblance of that amendment passes and we see some additional funds, it's gonna at least give us some guidance as to where we might be in the coming years and then we can have a really, really honest conversation as to whether what we expected matches what we are getting at that time, and based on what we are getting, what is a school district that we can have or not have in, the, uh, in this town. Right now, we are really going forward with a lot of hope, not based on fluff, based on a lot of work that we've been doing together the last so many years. And I, um, I'm sure all of you guys are putting a lot of volunteer time together. But when I got on this committee, this committee met once a month, once a month, and did not meet two summer months. So it was 10 meetings a year, and we just came in and, you know, and then walked out. We are having three, four meetings a month, if we have to right yep, now. Four hours. And our meetings, whatever time it is right now, it's 10, 13. This is basically a usual time for us to adjourn, almost, uh, you know. This is early. Yeah, yeah. this is. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, Mike, we didn't tell you that part. <laughs> yeah. And I know Tim is saying, oh, mine, I'm, I'm going to be here all night now. <laughs> oh, no. I think, I think let, let's, let's move on all because right, I, think, I think this general idea here is, is well understood. I think we'll keep that. Uh, if, uh, if you, in fact, have a plan, if you have a plan with goals and timelines, a uh, five year plan, I'd be absolutely marvelous in this kind of context. For more uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the, that much easier it's going to be in order to get anybody to be convinced that what you're doing is an appropriate choice of action instead of something else, something on, as an alternative. I know what but the, the plan is on has been since day one on our website, so it's 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 there. Um, it's, plan, it's a plan is a financial plan too, from our point of view. Yeah, well, yeah. our financial plan is is you know our budget and it's not a five-year budget but uh, if we can start aligning certain things we can actually put some numbers to it because you and I I think disagree on how strategic plans work but you know you have a strategic plan and then you assign some numbers to it as you start budgeting things uh, but well I live in a family and my strategic plan is based upon what it takes to run a family yes. you know, we've got a collection of families yes. in Granby and and no matter what you think up here from a business side the people who are paying the bills think of it from the family side. So yeah. it, you've you've got to have you got to have something consistent. But at any rate, uh, we have some more uh, maybe some fact questions would be easier to kind of yeah. get through. Do you have an estimate uh, how many students are going to be uh, how you 
how many students are going to be included in your school system um, next year? So I'm going to send you the Chapter 70 trends for the district, um, and that uh, assumes 777 students. Uh, but we do know that that um, number will go down a little bit. We're 756 of Granby students this mm -hmm. year. Right. And do you expect, you say the trend calls for more after all no. this? I thought you said down. Uh, 777 on Chapter 70. Uh, our right now is 756. Um, no, I think that's accurate. Sorry. So we expect more Granby kids next year in the school system than we have this year? It's been going down virtually every year for the last seven years. Um, so you were saying does, does that include? 70 resident Granby students, right, this year's. Right. And next year is 756? That's what we have, I think. 756 is what you use in your presentation. That's right. what's on the it's what's on the state website. It's 756 mm -hmm. of Granby students in the Granby school system for this year. Do you have are you using any kind of projection for how many you're going to have next year and also school choice, or do you not use projection of population? Well, I think we already talked about our projection for school choice. I mean, it's it's as close as you can come for an estimate until you go through the process for. Um, what happens in the summer and who ends up, you know, shaking out either in or out? Just using. The how about the grand? Yeah. So how about the grand? It's, 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 it's the grand It's the grand <laughs> students that really affect things. You expect. One of the things we've done is generate a chart, and it was based on grand students, school choice students, and a column for what to bring in for school choice students. And unfortunately, with the numbers as low as you know, with with having to cut the number of staff that we have down to where we are, the number of placements where we can put school choice students has narrowed through through the time. So yeah. what we're what we're expected to do as building administrators is to put those numbers in place to say, okay, so this year I have, you know, 44 first graders who are moving up to second grade next year. Of those 44, 12 of them are school choice. So that leaves us with the um, you know balance of of them as the Granby students, and then that only leaves us with two spots for school choice in second grade without raising our numbers too much that we would need another teacher. So we do the projections out like that, and it's on a spreadsheet, and yeah. it's easy to, to. I think what he's to asking though is just the Granby students. students, not choice. So what are our projections as far as how many Granby oh, students? Oh, 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 I'm sorry, I'm, I misunderstood. I don't have that at the top of my head. That's not how I read the question, so oh, I apologize. Okay. So okay. I, I can get you that. If, that, if you're not looking at Chapter 70, you're looking at no. um, yeah. Randy. Like sort of pre-K student right. population. Yeah. Yeah. How yeah. many four-year-olds are there versus 18 years? <laughs> no, I get that. So one of the things that I think that's interesting is that we're working with um, Children's First um, and their expansion project um, and uh, what they're doing around kindergarten. Um, what is Children's First? Uh, that is the, the preschool thing. Private 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 or an after school program. Yeah. It's, it's right Street. by Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah. Yeah. You know they're building well, they're massive building addition on their right program. Now. They're building on they're building a massive addition. If you go down Pleasant Street. Yeah, we got to get out more, John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that old house that's that's, the, that's what that is. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> one of the things we're doing is working with. Um, oh my goodness, it's really late. I'm not gonna remember. I know. Donna. Yeah, Donna. To talk about um, if they have preschool students um, and we have preschool, uh, how are we um, identifying students that may need um, intervention, but then also <coughs> how are we wrapping around student, uh, services for families, but also, you know, they pull, I shouldn't say this, in, uh, but they pull from uh, South Hadley and from Hadley, um, and so really trying to have an outstanding experience for them and then bring them right over to a brand new school. So that's one of the things that we're working with in terms of trying to partner um, and create these connections, bringing the kids over to the new school once it's built and really trying to, in speaking with her, what she feels is reestablish the pipeline of students because once they come to Granby for uh, 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 early childhood, they like it. They like the kids, the kids make friends, they're very comfortable, so we can sort of um, bring those kids right into kindergarten. So, And that's something that um, has not been happening in the past couple of years, um, and one of the reasons is we haven't been able to uh, open up enrollment in kindergarten because it will influence uh, class size. And Cheryl, we also added another half. Uh, that's right. Another? Half-day pre-K. Half 
So we have brought in um, eight more um, slots for peers, and then we have mm -hmm. um, seven slots for students with special needs. Well, at your leisure, if you can get, if you have an estimate for that matches up with the yeah. seven fifty-six. Sure, you might want to write that down. Because okay. it's late. Like, um, Bill can send us a chart. Here's the chart. chart. Well, I mean, he has the chart. I'll send you a chart. So, Aaron, how are you guys doing on the strategic plan? What is that? How are you doing on the strategic plan? I mean, I, I'm, I'm viewing it, and most of the dates have gone by. Uh, actually, get, once we're done with the budget, it's going to be updated, and we're going towards. We're thinking about uh, making it a five-year plan, as opposed to that was a three-year plan for us. Yep. And uh, many of the things are uh, either done or need to change, and that's exactly what we're going to do right after the budget season, and it's going to be updated. Okay. So one of the other things is, as a new superintendent to a district, um, I create an entry plan. Um, so for the first part, I um, interviewed all kinds of people, um, had many conversations, and really uh, looked at your strategic plan for the town, for the school department, talked to staff, talked to the leadership team, and re-looked at the strategic plan to see um, if there are uh, strategic initiatives that we need to readdress that are going to focus the, the work of the district. Um, and so that we will be doing uh, uh, actually, I'm going to be presenting my entry plan findings hopefully on Monday, but um, uh, that will be wrapped into a review of the strategic plan. Okay, uh, staffing levels. I'm kind of yes. curious as to what's included um, here. So, uh, um, I did not break out the staffing levels um, in what I'm going to share with you verbally, but um, I do have them broken out by uh, uh, category. Um, and they're broken out by administrators, instructional staff, instructional support staff, um, instructional support and special education shared staff, paraprofessionals, special ed related staff, it's almost over, medical health services, office clerical administrative support. So those are the categories. Um, I have the actual documentation that I can send to you, but in a nutshell, overall, um, in FY2, uh, 2015, there were 120.99 FTEs, and I, as I said, I, you know, in fiscal 15, FY15, 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 okay. no, 120.9, you might as well say 121. Who's the point nine? <laughs> That's what I looked at. I was like, really, Three people? people? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's got to be right. <laughs> Um, in FY16, it was 117.07. In FY17, it was 112.53. Mm -hmm. And we are estimating with the budget, because uh, you had asked, what is it in comparison to the budget? So yeah. we've estimated the reduction right now from attrition um, and resignation, uh, 107.5. So we've gone from 121 to 107.5. So I think we've... 14. Um, and so what the actual um, categories of, of uh, staff, uh, you get a better picture of where reductions were made. Um, and at a first blush, um, the majority are out of the instructional lines. Okay. So. Um, <clears throat> The couple of uh, questions related to this, these overall financial uh, picture. Uh, one was, as um, Jim had mentioned, um, a picture of what the school would look like with this full budget versus what it would look like at the minimum plus 305. What's the, what's the difference there? Can you say that again? Because I it, think I read your question <coughs> right, but well, it's if if you get if you get the override plus if, uh, people vote to take money from stabilization funds, uh, then you have the budget that you sent us, mm -hmm. uh, and so it's got all the stuff that's in there. Uh, if neither of those things passes, what is the budget going to look like? I mean, not what the amount will look like, but what does it what does it do for operations? Um, so we do start to get into the core instructional program at that point. So the deficit really is about a level service budget. Um, 
Um, and so it's estimating your fixed cost increases, any efficiencies you can gain. But really, the, the gap represents what the administration believes we need to have a level service. So if I put the key in the door on September 1st, I have the same programming that I had at the end of the mm -hmm. this year. Um, so beyond that, any reduction in that potential gap, I'll, and although we've reduced it a little bit, originally it was 756, which is what I think uh, we sent your way. That does represent level service. But, but maybe, I mean, maybe this is what I was saying earlier. Have there been discussions? Let's say there's no override and no additional funding. Your funding next year is state minimum plus 305, right? You still run a school next year. You don't close operations and go home, right? There's less spending than the level budget, clearly, right? Because this was the level budget, so you have less spending. What goes? I mean, do you know? How many know? teachers do you lose? No, no, I'm not even wondering how many teachers. I'm wondering, has there been the discussion yes. yet it's about what goes? Yeah, so. And we're trying to avoid having any detailed discussion right now because Right, and I guess that's vicious. that. That and and I understand vicious, it like, causes the anxiety. It causes all these things, but there is the problem. I think in terms of the communicate. In other words, it's possible, right? People in town here. Okay, this goes. Here's the school with just that amount of money, and maybe people are happy with that. You guys aren't happy with that school, but maybe people are happy with that school. Do you right? remember the picketing outside the high school? The picketing year? is not a hundred percent of the town, right? I mean, in other words. It, we're we live in a town of more than just the number of people that would have picketed. It's possible, right? And and the, to say that it's not possible means that what? There's nobody in town that would be happy with that lower school. I'm sure there's at least one person out there that would be happy with that I'm school. Sure too. I'm pretty sure right. too. Right. Exactly. So there's that one person out there that would, right? So without any discussion about, okay, well, what does that school look like? And then you say, okay, then we've got this other school that we want the extra money for. You make it very difficult for the non-true believer in either camp. There's the people that want to spend more and there's people that don't want to spend more. But we've got all these people in the middle that might be willing to spend more if they knew. If they knew how bad it could be. Now, so here's the thing. That, that's one way of putting it. How, how bad it could be could it or how good it would be, right? I mean, that's that exactly well, is the question. And without an answer to that question, it gets really hard to persuade, not the true believers, right? You are all persuaded about the extra money, and then there's the people out there that are going to vote against any increase no matter what, right? We've got those two sets of people, and, and those two sets of people, there's no point in you having a discussion with them, right? But it's the you're, swing vote in the middle. It's the exactly. swing votes I, in the middle. I'm hearing what you're saying. Right, and, and I guess I would say I am that swing vote in the middle, right? I'm the person that's sitting here looking at town finances saying, look, I like education, right? That's what I do for a living too, right? I mean, this is not like some bizarre world's me of schools and how schools spend money and all these sorts of things. But I also sit on a committee that looks at the police department, the fire department, and town things, and all these other sorts of things. And I'm sitting here saying, and I've been saying the same thing for nine years, right? I would like to be persuaded that yes, this is what it would look like, and am I okay with that? Am I not okay with that? This is what it would look like with all these other things, and I've loved all the stuff about getting areas of excellence and all these sorts of things. Here's what we would spend the money on, but all those things you're talking about spending money on aren't a level funding budget. That's more than a level funding budget, right? So now we've got three different possible steady states for the school. We've got this bare bones school that's still open. We've got the level funded where everybody's under stress all the time. We have this nice school, and I know you all got mad at me for saying nice school, but but it is the right description, right, so, so of this point, nice school. The point I'd like to make is um, going back to last year and uh, the funding that we ended up getting out of stabilization was what I think was in large part of doing that exact thing, was uh, demonstrating a clear picture of what the schools would look like had we made all of those drastic cuts that we had to make. Now, mind you, we only got 345000 and we still had to make all of those additional cuts. But when we went informational sessions and making PowerPoint presentations, and the information is out there, and it's, let me just finish yeah, yeah, my yeah. point. So when we finally got to the annual town meeting, um, it was clear in, in the affirmative vote of the three hundred forty-five thousand dollars, so it's 
this is an ongoing discussion and has been since the day after the budget closed last year and let me just except, except, except interject except interject one thing real quick you got 345,000 was the amount you asked for last year you're asking for 395,000 this year if I figure correctly that's more so you haven't done any cuts uh, why is this 395,000 not being asked for as an override do you have a plan that next year what do you, you mean won't we haven't done any cuts you're asking for more money next year than you're for the, you're not the, the 345 the 300 yeah we needed 800,000 the 300 the 345 is now being asked for even more than that to come out of stabilization fund and the total is 750 because, so because we did all the cuts we could do last year right exactly That's exactly you have you have really kind of firmly stated that you don't think any cuts can be made any place that run the kind of school system that you want in school. So why isn't the request to the town for an override for this whole amount of money? Because I think it's part of our, our plan um, and probably something that I will admit needs to be more clearly articulated that, um, that if we can begin to reestablish the school district as the district of choice and we are able to um, bring students that live in Granby back in addition bring students into Granby um, that historically had choice in we have a couple of things happen we have minimum net school spending go up we have incoming choice revenue go up um, and so you know for for me and I don't want to speak for the committee um, you know we don't fund the schools I feel like we don't fund the schools base level of the budget so in other words you heard me talk about what is minimum net school spending what what is the percent over in comparison to our other districts in 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 our in our surrounding areas you know three percent over minimum net school spending is is closer to what communities like Palmer Munson and where are spending and they are level three districts and so when you look at what our minimum net school spending communities like Hadley, South Hadley, Belchertown spending, and I'm not arguing that Granby should do that, but I think it's part of this discussion about why are we trying to make a decision that reflects Granby. You know, we're talking about 14% over minimum net school spending, 22% over minimum net school spending. You know, God forbid you go to the go to towards Boston, it's 40, 50, 60% of our minimum net school spending. So I think, you know, this is an effort to get us to a place where if we have the override of 305 and the um, override now, now we're looking at around 6%. If we can bring revenue back to the district, then you can start to see a revenue picture that's more, more sustainable. And how long is this going to take? Is anybody willing to stand up and say, this is going to take one year, two years, 10 years, 15 years? Is anybody willing to say anything? Well, I'm willing to say what I said before that let's just look at uh, fiscal year 2020 and then um, uh, hopefully at that time we're going to be in a... a we got the new tax thing. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and, please, please don't try to spend that money. Yeah. And, and I guess because, that's... Because by the time Stan Rosenberg gets done with it... <laughs> He's, he's got all sorts of things, but I haven't heard the word school be one of the strong things coming out of his and mouth. And I guess that's the kind Essential of Essential services is right. what he uses. That's the kind of argument. I get back to the earlier point, right? I mean, you say last year there was this clear picture, right? The reason I supported the the, the money coming from stabilization, stabilization fund last year had nothing to do with any of that. None of that found persuasive in the least. The reason I voted, supported it was we sat down at a meeting last year and we're told this is the last year we're going to be asking for this and we'll ask for an override. That's okay. You don't remember. That's what I heard, right? All, Maybe I misheard, all, right? All of us heard that. Uh, I, uh, I'll just declare. No, that was two, no. no, that was two years no, ago. No, that was, first of all, it was two years ago. And what I was in the meeting, too, and what we committed to was a short term plan and a long term plan. Right. That's so, what we committed to. You. I'm willing to say I misheard. I'm, I am willing to say I misheard it. I have no qualms saying I will put all the fault on me. I'm not worried about the blame, right? I will put it all on me. I totally misheard. That was the reason. I still have the same questions I've had all along, right? That like, well, what does it really look like without it? What does this look like? What is the good school? I mean, these are just sort of those just basic line questions that if you're going to ask me or other people like me who are persuadable, Right? These are the are kinds you? of questions. I'm starting to question that. <laughs> okay. And you know what? You can accuse me of not being persuadable, right? I mean, I can take it. I mean, like, whatever. But, but like, 
I mean, I'm not going to try to persuade you I'm persuadable. It's like, there are people who are persuadable. You may not think I'm one of them, right? But there are people in town who are persuadable, and I guess that's the kind of people that it would be good to answer their questions. A lot of the rhetoric around these issues has been people that want to spend more money on school talking to people that want to spend more money on school, and people who don't talking to people who don't. And there's a lot of these other people around that are just sort of saying, okay, well, how dire is it? And if every year you hear the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and we hear that, and the sky doesn't fall, people start saying, I wonder what's going on. And I think that kind of transparency level, here's what it would really look like. It's not just number of teachers being cut, but like, do we now just have French and not Spanish? And can I live with there's only one language being taught instead of four How's languages? That? I'll just say, those are the kinds of things that become very different. You know, I just hear teachers are being cut, and I'm sitting there thinking, gosh, now they're only going to have three art teachers instead of 16 art teachers, right? There will be people that that's sort of the impression they hear of teachers being cut, right? And you know there's not 16 art teachers. But they don't understand teachers. that it's like two math teachers. Two math teachers out of how many? And what will it do to class sizes? And what will all those things do? And then you lay that out. And it's entirely possible that the voters in this town look at that low-level school and say, that's okay with us. It's entirely possible they look at it and say, no, we want this other school. And that's where the persuasion comes in. And I don't think that's a bad question to be asking. And I know, and, and I get accused of this for nine straight years. You don't like education. You don't like all this stuff. You don't want to do this. And all I'm saying is, if I'm sitting down evaluating something, these are the kinds of questions I ask. I There's really no accusing, but I'll, I'll tell you two things. Uh, one is that the concept of sky falling is relative. For those people who actually left uh, Granby, the large number of people thought that the sky was falling and just say left. And that leaves us in the situation that we're in. Um, and, but for, for looking from, from the other perspective, I think, I think your question is fair. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. The challenge with, uh, we, we started with the thought of, at the time, at the time it was $756,000. How do we really go to override? I mean, we, we did start with, you know, is this a full override question? Then we started going back and forth and we ended where we ended. Few reasons for that. One is, there is really an expectation and the amendment that we're talking about actually is earmarked for education and transportation only. That's the way it is written, that's the way it's gonna be uh, put in front of the voters. So if anybody wants to do something different with it, they're going to have to go through tons of motions, and uh, th that's why it is it is uh, earmarked and worded the way it is. Th the reason is this: as we look at what an override means to anybody in this town, coupled with the expectation that in a couple of years there is a likelihood, at least in a likelihood, that an education earmarked amendment may pass and may help uh, alleviate some of the uh, problems that we are going through right now, the financial problems. We, the thought process was this. You have a portion of it on the um, uh, override side. Keep it to a reasonable minimal. And then let's try to have the conversation around some of the things that we shared earlier. Uh, the fact that you know we have a general fund stabilization uh, fund, or uh, you know something that is earmarked for operating purposes for the most part, and that we had actually a reasonably uh, good run around free cash, is it possible to, as we are moving that free cash to these stabilization funds, since people already paid taxes around those, is it possible to have this conversation with them and ask them and persuade them, as you said? To say, you know what, give give us these couple of years to, for us to see. Because if the third year is so, nothing comes, and I mentioned it, I don't know if it's going to be ten dollars or a million dollars. If it's ten dollars, then we have to have a conversation. Then we have to ask the town. You know what? There is no way you can you can really uh, we can really do it this way. Um, the, the challenge that we're having right now is we are basing a lot of things on a lot of assumptions. As we're making these assumptions, we did not really want to go to an override and have to explain tons of assumptions that folks may or may not understand because they are paying uh, at the end of the day for a lot of these things. So that was that was the that was the uh, uh, thought process. One thing that I will say though 
You're absolutely right that we tend to have conversations with like-minded folks, whichever side we are on. If anybody bumps into this fifth hour of this conversation or whatever hour it is and sees this, what I would love to have between now and the town meeting is a conversation or more with people who are actually not convinced with what we're trying to do. Because I, I, I completely agree with you. We're having these conversations on one side or the other. Let's just have the conversation. At the end of the day, they may say, you know what, uh, we, don't, we don't really buy what you're saying. That's good. But town meeting proves to be the wrong place for us to have these conversations. There is no opportunity to really have any uh, conversation in depth for us to be able to make our case. So uh, to your point, we have to have conversations with folks who are not convinced that this is the best way to go. I think, I'm sorry, I'm, I know I'm brand new here. No, it's La good. So Before. last year I was at the town meeting <laughs> and to your credit, I had a nice list of what the cuts you were proposing were for this way and that way. But what I didn't have, and what I think they're trying to say would be very useful, is you know, this teacher who was going to be let go, but what was left. So I think when you start to paint that picture into it also, mm -hmm. it's, it's very visually impacting. When you're sitting there saying, well, I'm going to lose three art teachers, and there's three art teachers, so there's going to be no more art program. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that's what you're yeah, saying. Exactly, right? exactly. Yeah. So maybe that's the step that needs to be done this year in preparation for the town meeting. It's that same list, but that's it. So here's what it is right now. Here's what it you know could, could, could be if we don't get the money. Yeah. But then, I guess, to, to maybe to your other point, extrapolate that out for the next two or three years. Yeah, I'm not, I, but I'm not can, sure about that. Yeah, but, you know, why, don't we, why don't we move on? I mean, yeah. We've got kind of the gist here just, of what all this is. Just to make sorry. sure, yeah, uh, legally, exactly. uh, <laughs> June 1st, actually, mm -hmm. we have to let everybody know that there is a deficit. And in the event that something doesn't go the way we hope and expect it to go, that there may be positions uh, lost or some of the uh, services, some of the programs may not right. be there. So it's actually a legal requirement that we have to go through. So to your point, I you know I understand uh, Jim where you're going and Mike absolutely. Th there has to be some some uh, right. thought around that anyway, whether we want it or not. There will be some stuff. Okay. Uh, you have uh, some revolving funds. Have a lot of what we've talked about is this uh, question of um, there are variations in the budget from year to year. Uh, some unexpected. Uh, some predictable but not uh, guaranteed um, and you traditionally have revolving funds to take care of that mm -hmm. uh, the town has stabilization funds mm -hmm. uh, to take care of that have you given any thought anybody tried to put any dollar figures to what you would have as an ideal kind of uh, set of revolving funds do you want to take it sure yeah, a year's worth of school choice and circuit breaker. <laughs> both of them. Yeah, both of them. Exactly. I mean, honestly, that's that's kind of the traditional model. Um, it, I mean, there's no set state regulation, but it's a good rule of thumb because you know it, it prevents having some of these knockdown, drag out discussions when you have fluctuations in your budget. And it's it generally, you know, unless you've got a you know these kind of issues with declining enrollment and things like that. It generally tends to set itself right. If you have you know one year where you have to dip into it a little more, you can generally make it up for make up for it the next year. And Granby used to have that. I mean, Granby used to have years back. If we look at the at the um, accounting software, used to have some very healthy budgets in school choice and circuit breaker, but they don't no longer exist. They were used to fund the budget. Okay, the school choice, well, the school choice money this year is five hundred fifty thousand dollars. How much? How much was circuit breaker? How much did you spend uh, in the circuit breaker? Uh, 328. 328. Uh, so you got about, um, yet somewhere about uh, $878,000 ideally that you would have as, uh, as uh, revolving funds. Um, I know you have some smaller funds, you have athletic and everything else mm -hmm. like that, but that, that's the bulk of, of what stuff is. Uh, the budget uh, that you're, the budget that you're coming to town for is in the $7 million mm -hmm. range? Eight million dollar range. Eight million dollar range. Okay, uh, it was a nice round figure. Ten percent. Ten percent of the budget. The budget that we saw was eight million nine twenty. Mm -hmm. Is it? Is that still the same figure? Or? It is. 
So it's whatever they, little adjustments happen. That, that's really a nine. Well, nine million. Nine. I was going to yeah. say, wait a minute. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But it's more nine. Yeah. Eight. 8.9. No, the, what, what, okay. what Bob's saying, he's what I'm trying to get exactly what he's saying. Anyway, your percent. deficit was oh, 760, and now your deficit is in round number 700. But your uh, budget is still the same. So how did how did that sleight of hand occur? Uh, I wouldn't say it's a sleight of hand. Well, um, what I would say is, account? as we said, <laughs> you know, when we present that budget in February. Uh, the superintendent budget we get feedback uh, from the school committee we get feedback from the public we go back and uh, address uh, level service versus uh, program improvements um, we're at a point where we can't get to program improvements um, so those come off um, and then you know as we get very deep into the budget um, we start looking at um, uh, staffing relative uh, to special programming and relative to special students um, and try to see if we can make adjustments there. You know, one of the things we looked at this year was uh, the kindergarten grant which funded uh, paraprofessionals in the kindergarten program. Uh, well, that grant no longer exists. So is that a decision that we make moving forward in terms of is that a, an expenditure yeah, that, this is, that is the school department? That's my question. Is. That's, that's what you... No, but so that's how it goes what Mark down. Said, what Mark said, yes, it's still 8.9 minus whatever adjustments. Correct. The adjustments. Oh, all right. It's minus the adjustments. Yes. So, so you actually did reduce in the last oh, month or so. Okay. You did reduce something. Okay. And we probably have 25 iterations of this. <laughs> yeah, that's Every time we have a change like that, we yeah we save it on okay. the worksheet. Now, on the town um, side, um, the way you think about revolving funds is that you've got a certain amount you might want to have in revolving funds. And then as years go by, you have some uh, things that happen in your budget that allow you to create a surplus for the year. You have some things that happen in the budget that allow you to, that don't allow you to create a surplus, but in fact charge, uh, have to come up with more charges for it. And uh, every once in a while there's a disaster. Uh, and, uh, you know, for example, the schools need an extra $700,000 for, for the year. Uh, but then you've got to figure out well, then what? Then do you say going forward you're going to live with a smaller reserve fund or do you have to find ways to replenish it? And the ways to replenish it are to conscientiously set up your budgets so you're spending less than you would under ideal circumstances or to ask people to kick in more money to raise taxes. If you think 10% um, contingency fund, then you have to think about what you're going to do about these other questions. What happens when the contingency fund is used? What happens if you can put some more money into it? Uh, it's, not, it's not as simple as saying, well, every year we want a 10% contingency fund. If we spend more money, we're gonna ask the town to spend more money because we've got this magic number that we wanna hold here. It, it doesn't really work like that. So even there, uh, you're, gonna always, you're always gonna have questions of whether or not you're absolutely convinced that level service is the only thing that you can do because you get to a situation then that if, if you ever have a, a problem your only choice is to ask for more funds from the town and I don't know if that's realistic well that kind of goes back to Cheryl's point though I think if if the base is is too low to begin with right other towns are funding at higher percentage rates than our town then maybe the question is is there a problem with the funding well, I mean, we can only get what we can get from the state, right? Chapter 70 funds. Um, I'm just, I'm just considering that as, right. as so, a question that. Um, well, the, the, from from our point of view, I think the question that has to be asked because um, if you take it out of one pocket, it has to go to another. Take it, put it into one pocket, it's got to come out of another. And the only choices are to come out of the pockets of the taxpayers. So I would suggest that you look at what our tax situation is compared to what our average housing values is in town. Or you take it out of other budgets. And you know as well as anybody that there's only one other budget in town that has $750,000 in it. Um, so uh, it's, these are still choices that the community is going to have to make. They either are going to agree with the program and they're going to fund it, or else they have to agree with the program and say, we don't need something else. But I think part of the conversation is also, you know, I have not worked in a district where I have been told my budget is minimum net school spending plus 305. 
I've, I've worked in districts where this conversation starts in November and December with these people around mm -hmm. the table and the administrators talking about this is the change in our student population. We're seeing sanctuary city families coming in. I need an ELL teacher. You know, those, now that may be a one, that may be an unanticipated expenditure for one year, but that family is, those students are still going to need that teacher moving forward, so it has to be built into the, the base of the budget. So, you know, I, I just am surprised and hope that we can have a conversation about what is, why is it that it's minimum 305, that's it. Well, first of all, we haven't said that. It started off, I think, I thought very carefully way back at 7 o'clock that uh, I was fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, whatever you want for the budget, if you want more than the 305 plus the 440 retired teachers' health care, uh, health insurance plus um, transportation, uh, we're not going to have a problem with it as long as you get it from the proper source. And the only source that that can come from is by increased taxes. It can't come out of stabilization fund and have any expectation at all that the school system continue to live like that. I, I think the that's all we're saying. We're not saying we're, we're we're against it. You know, the the number of people, the five people on the finance committee here, have a very strong interest in education. Uh, you know, um, among this group, two people currently teach. Uh, there are two PhDs, three MBAs, uh, a law degree, countless professional designations. You, you, you couldn't pick at random five people from the town and have a more interest in education than this group does. But that's still, but still. And a partridge and a pear tree. Right, yeah. And, but, but still the, the question is, is that when we look at where the funding is going to come to do all these things in town, we can't continue to do everything we do in town and then do more without finding a place for money. So you want guess, to do more in the schools, we've got to do less in the town. So I would respectfully ask then, have we reached out to our surrounding communities to understand how is it that their per pupil expenditures are ranging between $500 to $2,000 more than what Granby is able to provide? Have we reached out and found out what is it that they're doing in terms of their budget process, in terms of the conversations they have, the people that come at the table? Is there a negotiation that happens? Is it that one year there, there's There are two things. There are two, two big factors. One is um, average home values measure overall wealth of community. And the other thing is the size of the school. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of study. I don't know if you already know the answer to this, but just a quick look at um, size of school systems. They're like they're like 400 school systems in the Commonwealth, um, more than the number of towns because there are regional schools and everything else like that. And um, to have uh, to have 756 kids in a school is very There's very 15 small. In the Commonwealth. Very very small. There's 15 districts in the Commonwealth that have between one and a thousand students. And the median per pupil expenditure is $15,389 per student. So yes, we need to have that conversation because how is it that 15 other districts that have the same type of population, how is it that they are generating the, the revenue to, to fund or the commitment within the town, whatever it is, to, to have that funding source. I agree. I think, I think in answer to your question about why it is, I mean, I found it puzzling too, the sort of flat plus the 305. You are the first superintendent I've sat in a room with that is interested in even asking this sort of a question, right? That, that Because in order to have the kind of conversation you were talking about, sitting back in November, you'd have to have a superintendent in a school committee that's willing to sit down and say, here's our budgets, here's the books, let's have these conversations that are hard and have all these conversations. No, no superintendent before this has been willing. And so I think in some ways it's been convenient that you have this sort of a funding arrangement, the superintendent school committee can then go do whatever they want, and nobody's sitting around and asking all these questions like this, right? I mean, nobody would have ever been willing to sit here and answer these questions before now, right? And so to move to a model where you're doing that is going to involve, well, okay, need more transparency all around. We're going to sit around and have these conversations. There's going to be more discussion about it, you need all the bursa, and so on. And I think it's just been, and it may have been a bad practice, may have been a good practice in the past, but if the idea is going forward, you want to look like those others, then it is going to require 
a completely different way of thinking about this, which then raises all of these questions that John's raising, which again, I think the school committee and the superintendent historically would want it done, like, we're not a rich town, right? We're a small town, right? Are these other ones rich towns, small towns? I mean, all these sorts of questions which would be hard to answer, right? Mm -hmm. But if we found out we're a poor town with a small school district, and that's why we spend less, that's that's not necessarily the kind of answer anybody yeah. really wanted when you started the process, but that's the kind of questions we'd start finding out. Also, from our point of view, it seems to be sort of head in the sand approach to uh, the, is the, is the health the school districts that you're looking at that are comparable to us or Lenox, a wealthy town. A one. Right. A right. Wealthy town. Right. West Boston, not as wealthy, but wealthier than <coughs> Right. Um, no, yep, yeah, agreed. And, and so, that may be true, um, but the other piece is it's still similar, which means that, that you know, you still got to keep the lights on, that, you know, they still oh, no, have no, no, adequate no, no. buildings. But that's, that's why we don't spend 15. Oh, right. Buildings. But the question is, how come they get to spend more money per student than we do? Well, they got basically, you know, a if higher you're, tax rate. Your tax base is higher. <laughs> you know, so that actually, that goes to our, that kind of reinforces our point that we're not adequately funded, regardless of our size, Regardless of what's happening in the district, we're not adequately no. funded. Well, there are two That's things: yeah. not adequately funded, plus not choosing the right place to be adequately funded. You're never going to get adequately funded by taking money, by you having it part of your plan to take money out of stabilization fund. It will get you through probably as long as everybody here is on either a finance committee or a school committee. It will get a lot of the people who are in school right now through to the end of school, but it doesn't last. Right? It cannot last. Right. And we understand that, and that was part of our commitment to you two years ago when we said we were going to come up with a short-term plan and a long-term plan. And part of our long-term solution was somehow changing the base of the funding. And I think that's the hard question, right? I mean, because colleges face the same thing, right? You know, we're not all Harvard, right? And so <laughs> lots of schools get into lots of trouble because they look at Harvard and say, we should offer all the kind of programming Harvard offers, but they don't have the funding base to be Harvard, and they run perpetual budget deficits, and they're in perpetual financial crisis because they always think they want to be Harvard, but they just can't be. They could be perfectly good at another level, but they can't be that. And so that becomes one of those inner town comparisons of sort of making right. the case of sort of, well, what are we really looking at? How nice of a school system can this town afford? Not how nice of a school system can Cambridge afford, but what can this town afford? What are people in this town willing to pay? Those are hard questions, right? But but that goes back to what I was pointing out in terms of where do you basically focus your qualitative and quality? Right. Uh, you know, I would areas. love, I would love for you guys to come into the school and just spend a little time with some of the folks that actually work there. I've, I've, I've had kids go through that school, let's be clear. I am not unaware of what the Granby School is. I'm saying that is because you're, you're going to see how far that we have stretched the resources, not only with the administration and the teachers, but just, you know, trucks that, I mean, my kid, it's unsafe for him to go on, to, to go to his wrestling matches that are an hour and a half away in these hill towns that you know, I'm literally crossing my fingers. So it's not, we understand we're not a Harvard and we don't want to be a Harvard. We, we get that we are a small town. What, what we're asking for is funding so that we can safely, adequately provide an education for all the students in the town. I don't think it's an unreasonable we're not, we're not, want. I think what he's saying is we're not painting that picture clearly enough. That, that's, that's all, all saying. I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Let's do two more quick questions. Uh, <laughs> school repairs. <laughs> it's only two. <laughs> school repairs. We, we've heard a story no, about an application to MO. <laughs> you, you seem to ask the MSBA to participate. Yes, we did. Uh, so we school did. repairs and then uh, <laughs> any. Uh, what it was based on the capital plan um, that the interim superintendent had uh, completed. Um, but it was. Uh, it did not encapsulate um, the new building, so there were, the capital plan, um, although well developed, some of the things have to come out because the new building uh, was passed. And so um, when we moved the capital plan forward, um, the MSBA accelerated repair project really was for the Granby Junior Senior High School. 
understanding that West Street was now going to be closed and uh, East Meadow would uh, become the new Granby School. Uh, and so all of those expenditures would uh, come off the table. So the net of it is the roof was estimated at 905000 um, The windows, uh, there was no estimate in the capital uh, request because it wasn't in their capital request. It was actually in the documentation of the evaluation of the high school. It just stated that the windows needed to be uh, replaced. And I'm not sure I did not have an opportunity to ask Judy why the windows were not uh, valued or estimated mm -hmm. for cost. Uh, the boiler at the high school was 530000 um, and I, I would be happy to send you the application in its entirety. Um, and also about the boilers, the reason we had spoken about the boilers is because um, I was on the Energy Commission last year and the state had told us that we could get um, money through the Green Community Grants to replace those boilers and I don't know whatever happened with that because I'm no longer on that committee. Um, but that was actually part of the discussion that was happening last year that that money would go towards boilers but so from what you said it sounded like there was one program and what a report or an application or what was sent into the msba About the an, application. an application an application mm -hmm. and but it, did the application just sit there have we heard anything well, back I've from them checked um i haven't gotten any feedback um that it has been approved or not, uh, but I do believe they're awarding the projects as we speak, so um, Emery reminded me to give them a call. So you basically amended that application, or you put in a new I one in? It, okay, so the original was for a new building. No, right? but whatever we put in last was for the repairs that we just talked about. In fact, it was... Uh, mine. But it goes, the, the yes. latest one that you put yes, in was, was based on the request. capital uh, capital plan that we uh, had put together and we had shared and the town actually declined to even consider it a couple of years in a row. So what we found out was that MSBA had this plan that may or may not accept whatever we have. So we went with that capital plan to MSBA asking for at least partial reimbursement and we did not hear back yet. So uh, so you have a, a current version of that in them yes. for some unknown amount of money? Correct. Unknown only by the window amount, or was only it? by the window amount, right? Okay, for the rest of it, it's just these. They didn't ask these. in the application for an amount, so I, I would. I would. <laughs> it's just, what do you need? And I was like, all right, great. I want the well, listen, they, I want they the get some wins out of this at a zero level. They can fund it entirely. <laughs> there are Add a few zeros whenever it comes right, back up. Right. <laughs> oh, she came up uh, with a million and a half. Without, yeah, without the windows. Yeah. So, so a million and a half and, and more. Right, and then you know the question is, if it moves forward, what is the reimbursement on that? Because it's similar to a building. And they'll tell you before the town accepts any of this. But uh, for example, they can they so can. So the town approved to move the application forward. The no, the board the select, select. I'm sorry, the select board. Right, the town doesn't even know that they're going to be asked to spend. This is a different program than like the school renovation. Right, but it still costs. It still. Yes. Costs right. the citizens something. And the reason something. why we we pushed it through the way that we did was because we were under a time a timeline there was it was um the i see the application I date the deadline date i can't even think straight anymore the deadline date was coming up and we wanted to make sure that the application was put in before the deadline right i understand so the the conversation that i know you want to have is okay how are you going to fund it, it? <laughs> well it's it's more than that it's it how will how will the msba um commit to spending any of their money before they find out that the town has committed to spending money. Well, this was, I, as I understand the program, it's for emergency repair, so I just think the parameters are different, right? Well, yeah. but the, but the but town it's, still it's has the, to agree it's the same to spend way, some isn't money. It? First you yeah. get the estimate, then you ask the town whether or not they would fund it, and then the town says yes or no, which is the same thing we did for the building project. Right, except you have neither an estimate nor yes it, it's a larger larger project so the process is different this is just uh you know and, and you haven't asked the town process. first we actually asked the town twice and we did not even get a date the capital capital planning committee declined to even meet with us 
<laughs> so this is basically this is basically what you know the uh, mitigation factor ended up being. That's what so it you you did that because that's where you had to go. But is the MSBA going to look favorably upon an application which has no town commitment to? Well, it has you know, the school system, they it, won't even look at you until you agreed to. It has look, a commitment look, of the vote. Jean, you're on the, you're on the school building the committee. You know that for... for the select if, voted. Yes, the select board yeah. voted. When, when <laughs> there is an <laughs> approval yes. needed, MSBA asks for that level of approval. What am I so now we're basically uh, uh, debating whether or not the MSBA is allowing us to do something that eventually may not happen. This is the early application process that only required the select board's approval. And that's where we are. And if you know there is any capital or any uh, uh, expenditure related to it, just like anything else, it has to go through the town. So I think I understand your question. But MSBA, unlike the uh, well, not unlike the previous project, has the rules for this one. You get the approval from the select board application, and if they say they, if they even say okay, then you know we start having the other conversations. So there. What you're asking for is approval from them to go back and start the official process of getting a set of approvals. Now you're asking me what the process is, which I don't. I mean, okay. what I'm okay. Yeah. All right, that's, that's fine. That's fine. All right. So, do you rather be on the school committee or on the MSBA? <laughs> Well, who's, who's, who's got the harder job <laughs> in all these things? It's yeah. 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 Right. The new school, yeah, whatever that is, right? And then 290. What is 290? 290 is what you're asking for. Yes. Right. And whatever this is going to be, all uh, coming out of taxes. So here's the thing. And, I, you know, I, 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 I understand your question, and it's very late, so I will... You know, I will be brief, brief and say yes. And, and yes. <laughs> <laughs> are yes. Those, are, those are all Ten different, will be done. different <laughs> items that will be voted differently and they pertain to different things. Yes, there's a new school, but you know, why bring the new school when we already voted for it? The town already approved it. Uh, the, the roof and everything else that we are talking about, well, you know, we're going to have the conversation whether we like it or not at one point, and this was. In fact, to benefit the town, so we could get that partially uh, reimbursed. So I do understand your question, Scott. But this is not really when we tell everybody, look, you know, the schools cost so much money. Well, you know, everything costs so much money. Then just you know, uh, John said earlier, the taxpayers, taxpayers actually are paying for every single thing that goes on in the state. So you know, if we get into that that type of level of detail, yes, I you know, I, yes, it will be an additional amount that we need to discuss. But if folks say, you know what, we don't want to discuss or we don't want to pay, just that's a conversation to be had. This particular one is related to something that actually was put in front of the town a couple of times, and you know, we did not even get a date to discuss it. So. If chance, you know, we get lucky, maybe we get some reimbursement from the state and save the town some some money. That's the that's the hope. Otherwise, yes, when you accumulate it, it is additional. <laughs> okay. okay, absolutely. Last question, or at least last set of questions. Yeah. How's this year going? Are you going to have a surplus? It's Are you going to have great. a deficit? <laughs> Are we done? Financially, <laughs> financially, <laughs> financially. Um, you have any we idea? are cautiously optimistic. Uh, we do have a budget freeze in place, um, so nobody goes anywhere and nobody gets to buy anything. Um, but with that being said, you know, I have always worked in a budget um, and tried to maintain uh, expenditures within our budget. So I was um, surprised when uh, the request was made. Oh, you know, just come forward. So I'm I'm glad to learn that this evening. Um, but with that being said, those unanticipated um, expenditures that Carol was talking about um, do push us quite up to the limit in terms of what the budget can uh, sustain. So we're, we're optimistic and hopeful. Um, okay. And we need lots of kids to eat lots of lunch in June. Uh. So <laughs> then we'll be good. <laughs> okay. I assume nobody has any other questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this has been a very good meeting, uh, as far as yes. we're concerned. I hope that you have felt so yeah. also. Uh, you know, uh, and I, I also certainly agree, as you've stated, that uh, unfortunately these meetings take place awfully late in the budget cycle. Uh, and uh, anything, uh, anything can be done to help 
uh, try to gain an understanding of the real nature of the operations earlier on in the year is a good idea. Um, do we have any other business we need to uh, do tonight? Well, so we're we're going to be we're going to be ready to. I left uh, my house at eight a.m. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just be clear. I'm ready. Yeah. I, I just want to be a jerk. So we're going to we're going to turn the thing in second. Okay. All favor. Aye. Thank you very much.